Audiobook Title, Mix Audiobook Collection The 4th of October 2023 Walker of the Worlds Chapter 1829 Two Singing Swords Yao Chengying had not expected Lin Mu to be this dismissive about the attack. I've lost too many of them, so I kinda need to care. Lin Mu replied to the woman, making the audience stunned. Though, now that I know, I may as well not wear them, he said before letting the tattered robes fall off. Lin Mu's golden body was revealed and shone like a lamp. His muscles which had been tempered through years of effort and pain looked imposing. Enough. Yao Chengying seemed irritated and slashed out again. Tilda clank clank. This time, Lin Mu defended against the slashes in a rather crude way. He directly used his bare hands to slap the sword slashes. Similar to before though, the slashes only broke partly, with the remnant still striking Lin Mu's body. He's still fine? The audience wasn't able to figure out why. Once again, faint lines appeared where Lin Mu was struck by the two broken sword slashes. The people who saw this were fleet stunned, while some tried to make sense of it. He, he's a body cultivator. The audience finally realized, there were hundreds of body cultivators in the audience along with other experienced cultivators thus after seeing Lin Mu easily defend against the sword slashes they found it easy to come to a conclusion. Before this, Lin Mu had fooled them by using his chi skills and sword skills for the most part. Even in his battle against Tan Ning, while his body cultivation was revealed on some level, the people attributed it to some defensive skill. It makes sense. His chi cultivation is just at the second tribulation stage of the immortal realm, but his body cultivation is definitely higher. No wonder he managed to come this far, he was simply hiding it all. The audience broke out in an uproar, it was so obvious, how did we miss it? They couldn't help but question, his sword skills are too good. I just thought he was a dedicated sword cultivator. Even his Tao skills are too good. I don't think anyone that focused on Tao skills that strong would also be able to focus on their body cultivation too. They tried to come to possible explanations. SSH. Just look at the fight. I don't think that's all he was hiding from us. An old expert silenced the juniors around him. Tilda clank clank clank. And sure enough. Looking up they saw Lin Mu face off against Yao Chengying directly using his body. The woman's sword slashes were problematical in that they couldn't be fully blocked, but they still didn't manage to deal that much damage to Lin Mu. The unstoppable sword slashes even made Lin Mu wonder just how was Yao Chengying was doing this. Her sword skills are certainly top notch. Her comprehension also seems to be one that has been gained through many years of learning. Lin Mu thought, but this doesn't match up with her actions from before. If it was all correct, she shouldn't have sword skills like this. He wondered. Yao Chengying might not be able to inflict much damage on Lin Mu right now, but her attacks still contained enough impact to push Lin Mu back. She prevented Lin Mu from getting close to her and also seemed to be intensifying her attacks. I need to get close to her to use the bracelet but her attacks keep on pushing me back. Lin Mu tried to think of a method of overcoming this. Tilda clank clank. Lin Mu slammed his palms against another sword slash, this time focusing on the dispersal of the sword intent contained within it. This won't work. I can't sense it fully, Lin Mu muttered to himself. The sword intent itself is meant to dissipate somehow. It is also why it is able to keep its force even while being blocked. Having realized this, Lin Mu figured out at least one aspect of the sword intent. Tilda clank clank, he swung his palms around, trying to deflect the sword slashes this time, but still managed to fail, as the sword intent simply broke a part of them where his palms struck, the rest of the sword intent still continued towards his body. The sword intent's property seems to be dispersal. Instead of letting the entire sword slash collapse, it sacrifices a part of it to continue onwards. Lin Mu analyzed further. By now, Yao Chengying was also starting to realize that her attacks weren't doing much to Lin Mu. As such, she decided to change her method of attack. Tilda Shua, she held her sword horizontally in front of her as her aura changed into a new form. 
dance of the flourishing flowers. Yao Cheng Ying lightly muttered, Tilda hum, as if her sword was singing. A melodious tone was heard and Yao Cheng Ying's aura transformed. Oh, Lin Yu's immortal sense picked up on the transformation and also what Yao Changing was doing. Her sword intent is merging into her aura. Tilda whoosh. A couple of seconds later, a wave of energy spread from Yao Cheng Ying, carrying with it thousands of flower petals. Tilda Xing. Yao Cheng Ying twisted her sword and twirled it in the air, creating illusory flower petals that flew out. The illusory flower petals were larger than the other flower petals that were surrounding and exuded a lot of power. Feeling the pure sword intent contained within all the petals, Lin Mu couldn't help but feel his own sword intent getting excited. Very well, I'll figure it out as we go, Lin Mu said before withdrawing afternoon pine again. You're using petals, I'll use trees. Tilda Xing, the double-edged sword hummed similarly as if taunting the opponent's sword. Golden Noon Pine, Lin Mu slashed out with the sword, as yellow pine trees composed of metal immortal chi rose from it. Tilda Deng Deng Deng, pine trees composed of metal immortal chi rose from it. Tilda Deng Deng Deng, the metal pine trees collided against the thousands of petals filled with sword intent creating a noise that seemed to be composed of two opposing songs. Tilda Boom, the two melodies reached a crescendo before finally exploding apart. Chapter 1830 Natural State The clash of the two sword intents was both dangerous and beautiful at the same time, making the audience marvel at it. A cloud of dust and debris covered the area of the clash, hiding both Lin Mu and Yao Cheng Ying in it. But inside this, a mix of yellow and pink swirled. The yellow color was from Lin Mu's sword attacks while the pink was from Yao Cheng Ying's sword slashes. Damn it, we can't see shit. The audience was bothered by the blocked screen. Tilda whoosh. Thankfully, just a few seconds later, another attack from the two contestants blew all the dust away. It revealed the scene of the fight that had greatly changed from before. Deep craters mixed with long gullies were left on the ground. The rocks that composed the ground had been thoroughly ground to dust due to the thousands of petals from Yao Cheng Ying's attacks while the metal pine trees of Lin Mu had fissured it to no end. You're certainly improving, Lin Mu muttered, looking at the tens of small dents that were left on his skin. Yao Cheng Ying's petals had hit him several times, which were a lot stronger than her previous sword slashes. It was clear that she had been holding back this entire time. As for what reason, Lin Mu didn't know. All he knew was that she probably had a lot more to show, and he needed to match up to it as well. Through this clash, Lin Mu also realized that just his own sword skills alone won't be enough to go up against Yao Cheng Ying. He had gotten damaged from the woman's attacks, albeit it was still not on the same level as Tan Ning. But then again, Tan Ning was using all his power and also had the advantage of lightning bypassing my defenses. Lin Mu thought to himself, Yao Chen Ying will surely be using more and more of her power as the fight goes on, it'll eventually reach a point where my defenses won't hold up either. He realized, Lin Mu glanced at Yao Chen Ying who was dancing around with her sword, creating more and more petals. It was clear that her attacks were about to get stronger than earlier. I had thought about this beforehand too, but guess this just confirms it all. Lin Mu thought before taking a deep breath. Holding back all this time had been getting a bit annoying, but I guess this much is enough, he said, confusing Yao Cheng Ying. Tilda Hu Ala. In the next moment, a surge of awe arose from Lin Mu's body, revealing his endless vitality. Tilda Hong. The vitality continued to rise until it became almost palpable. A red aura surrounded Lin Mu, which was built from pure vitality. Heavens! What even is that? The body cultivators in the audience stood up, seeing the scene. What is his body cultivation base for his vitality to be that strong? Have you seen any other body cultivator like that? They couldn't help but ask amongst themselves. Not many. Some can replicate that. But what Taoist Mulin is showing isn't even his body cultivation aura. That is pure vitality, one of the body cultivators replied. What does that mean exactly? 
A child with a doubt treading realm cultivation base asked, it means. He hasn't even started to use his body cultivation yet, the body cultivator answered, that vitality is something that is something normal to his being, if it is only appearing now it only means that he had been sealing it within him all this time, the body cultivator explained, this is his natural state, he added, stunning the people that were hearing him, natural state, do you even know what you're saying right now, another body cultivator protested, if this is his natural state, do you intend to say he's the same as the steel horned general? The general's mention aroused the memories about the tournament in which he had fought, as well as his many exploits. He was well known in the Rust Sky world as one of the strongest body cultivators and also as one of the winners of the tournament of the four guardian beasts. He might as well be. I don't have to say much. We'll see soon enough, the first body cultivator said with a frown while pointing at the formation screen. Tilde Hong Long. And sure enough, the audience didn't need to guess for long as the truth revealed itself to them. Lin Yu's body seemingly grew in size, while a couple of patterns appeared on his body. The first one was on his chest, which was that of an inverted triangle from which multiple bands extended. These bands reached his shoulder and wrapped around his back where another pattern was present, but this pattern was different and a lot more detailed than the one on his chest. Wait, that totem isn't that. Someone recognized the totem on Lin Mu's back, but before they could speak more, a loud roar was heard. The roar seemingly came out of Lin Mu's body, as the pattern on his chest glowed in a red light. A second later, the form of a large beast materialized behind him. Tilde Roar. The large beast was a giant bear that had horns on its head as well as long claws that reached nearly a foot in length. Its own height was about five meters tall and looked massive compared to Lin Mu. Tilde Mu. But another loud cry was heard. This time coming from the totem on Lin Mu's back. The totem was that of a legless bull and gleamed in a yellow and red light. The totem's cry caused another beast's form to appear. This form appeared above Lin Mu's head and was even bigger than the bear behind him. Similar to the totem on his back, it was that of a legless bull. The bull only had a body and horns on its head. It looked to be furious and puffed out red steam from its nostrils. No way. That. It can't be. The body cultivators trembled upon seeing the bull. Chapter 1831 Tyrannical Display What is that? The child couldn't help but ask upon seeing the two beasts, feeling immensely curious. Other people in the audience were also wondering the same, not knowing the significance of the two beast forms that had appeared. I don't know what that bear is but that. That is. The tyrant bull. Tilde Moo. As if on cue. The bull's form above Lin Mu's head let out a cry before a great strength filled Lin Mu's body. A tyrannical aura surrounded him as two terrifying beast forms backed him up. Tilde Roar. The giant bear roared as well. Joining in with the tyrant bull, not wanting to be underestimated, the two beasts infused their powers into Lin Mu's body. While it kept on growing. I would have never thought I'd get to see Tyrant Bull Marrow Secrets today. An elderly body cultivator in the audience said. The Tyrant Bull Marrow Secrets was one of the best body cultivation techniques that many body cultivators yearned to practice. Despite the fact that the manual for it was actually common, not many could go ahead with their desires. Obtaining the Tyrant Bull Marrow was a difficult and expensive task that only a few body cultivators with a rich and powerful background could afford. But that was merely half the battle. In order to actually be able to practice the technique, one needed to make the Tyrant Bull's spirit submit to them. It was a task harder than anything else, and most failed at this step. And through some luck of talent, they did manage to survive this but they would still have to continue surviving it further. After all, being a body cultivator was the same as always having a tribulation on one's head. Those with weaker wills could not survive this. Thus, while the tyrant bull marrow secrets was a strong technique accessible to many, seldom did anyone try to practice it. Seeing someone actually practice and succeed in the technique was even rare. Just what level has he reached? The people in the audience couldn't help but wonder. Looking at the tyrant bull's form, it is still legless. He should be at the third level and equivalent to the third tribulation stage of the immortal realm. 
the elderly body cultivator answered for the others, third tribulations stage in body and second in chi. He's done both almost at the same level. Many couldn't believe that someone could balance both this well. Don't forget, he's also using a risky technique like the tyrant bull marrow secrets and even his sword skills with a strong sword intent. Another cultivator reminded Tilda Raw. While the audience was marveling at Lin Mu's capability, the man in question was ready to act. The tyrannical aura surrounded him and was reinforcing his body as well. Lin Mu could tell that his body was different than the last time he had used the tyrant bull marrow secrets. Their great slumber bear bloodline is also amplifying my body with its power. I guess the tyrant bull's spirit made it come out too. Lin Mu thought to himself, combing them with the true gold body forging arts, I should be able to handle even more attacks. He reckoned. Yao Cheng Ying gazed at her opponent and felt shocked. Lin Mu, who had exceeded a height of two meters and was exuding a tyrannical aura unlike anything she had seen so far in the tournament, to her it was a massive difference as his style and demeanor seemed different. All the skills and methods that Lin Mu had used in his earlier fights seemed incomparable to what he was showing now. The past information might not work here. Yao Cheng Ying thought, furrowing her brows, but he is still lacking. She had her own pride and wouldn't be backing down this easily. Flourishing flower sword art, dazzling petal rush. Yao Cheng Ying spun her sword before thrusting it towards Lin Mu. This created a spiraling wave of energy that carried thousands of pink petals with it. They rushed towards Lin Mu, threatening to grind him to dust. And yet, Lin Mu was unfazed, having a look of casual confidence. Tilda Hu, taking a deep breath, his chest perked up before he made his move. Clenching his fist tightly, Lin Mu threw a simple punch. Tilda rumble. And yet, the simple punch transformed into something otherworldly. A tyrannical aura coalesced around his fist and transformed into a large fist imprint, it then rose towards the incoming petals, colliding with it effortlessly, the pink petals were like paper against the fist, crumbling into specks of chi and dissipating, the sword intent contained within the petals managed to sustain the power, but the tyrannical aura of the fist was simply too domineering, it crushed the sword intent, forcefully making it disperse, he blocked it, he actually blocked the attack fully, the audience screamed in shock, they had seen the unstoppable attacks of Yao Cheng Ying and had thought that it would be the same as before, and yet, a simple fist of Lin Mu's had collapsed the entire attack in one go, ho, oh, looks like this is what I need to keep as a standard, Lin Mu said, opening his fist into a claw form, if it is just this much, then I can do this all day, he smiled wildly, a rush of excitement and violence spreading through his heart, Tilda boom, with a single stomp, he turned into a blur, appearing right in front of Yao Cheng Ying, Gar, the woman was still a fifth tribulation stage immortal and managed to react to it, thrusting with her long sword, Tilda Deng, Lin Mu's red and yellow hand that was bare, struck the sharp sword of Yao Cheng Ying, creating a shockwave between them, Tilda kaboom, both of them were pushed back in this, while Yao Cheng Ying's sword was deflected back. Tilda Trip, a single drop of blood fell from Lin Mu's hand, and a small cut could be seen on it. That's a strong sword, for sure, Lin Mu said, looking at the cut on his hand that was already healing. Is she still holding back? He couldn't help but wonder. Title, System vs Rebirth, Chapter 853 Undying Fire that's basically what happened in the Muevil Kingdom. Raincott had finished recounting the information he got from the spies that the Greenwood Kingdom had planted. I'm sure that other kingdoms have learned about her existence as well. To think she would be that strong, she can use the true spirit body as well, no? After listening to Anna's story, Noel couldn't help but fall silent. On the one hand, his ice abilities had improved drastically over the past week. On the other hand, it was nowhere near Anna's level. Noah looked down for a moment, wondering what he should do. While he treated Anna as his ally, she was also his rival. There was no way Noah liked the fact that he was currently weaker. That silence of his couldn't help but make Rain cut a little bit sad. He comforted him by saying, 
you don't have to think too much, your progress is exceptional as well, if the Ardigan family is still backing you, you would have reached the same level as her, Noel didn't reply to him, causing Raincart to think that Noel hadn't recovered, Raincart asked, that's right, you're planning to reach the spirit grandmaster during your stay here, right, from the looks of it, you are already at the peak of spirit master, is there anything troubling you, although I'm not good with swords or runes, I'm good at elemental spirit, maybe I can advise you or something, Noel's eyes lit up as he looked at his grandfather, there was always one thing that stuck in his mind, even after learning the secret from Damien, he didn't know how to master his undying fire, yes, he managed to improve his control and its intensity due to old Rue's training, but he was nowhere mastering it, actually, I have been wondering about something, Noel scratched the back of his head, feeling a bit embarrassed, he thought this was just a simple question, so the fact that he didn't know it made him look ignorant, it reminded him of how he first started, what's wrong, Raincart asked with a serious expression, that expression startled Noel, it felt like Raincart was telling him that asking any questions was never a dumb action, Noel felt reassured and decided to share his problem, I'm confused about my flame, I don't mean to brag, but my flame is strong, it's so strong that I feel like something is missing, continue, Raincart nodded in agreement as he had seen Noel's undying fire previously, I'm not very sure about this, but, Noel pointed his palm to the side and started forming his undying fire, after that, the flame flared up, releasing an intense heat, yet, when it died down, Noel replicated the same thing, surprisingly, the flame didn't release an intense heat, but it reduced everything to ashes, as you can see, I'm kind of confused, on the one hand, I can control the temperature, the heat, and its burning power, on the other hand, I can't relate this flame to the one in nature, because of that, you don't know how to proceed, Raincart asked a core question, showing that he was listening attentively, yes, Noel explained, I have asked my spirit, but that's actually the last requirement for me to master my flame, so, have you put any thought into it, yes, if I can control the temperature, I can control the heat, but it's kind of conflicting with the burning power because it can burn everything even without releasing that heat, no, I'm not talking about that, what do you think about those three characteristics, no, should I say, what is actually your flame, Raincart asked, um, Noel tilted his head in confusion, it felt like Raincart was questioning him about the flame characteristic, but at the same time, there seemed to be another profound meaning behind that question. What is my flame? Noel muttered that question while looking down. Now that I think about it, why is Ardigan's flame called undying fire? How about other things like just fire? Why does Ardigan specify its name to be undying fire? Noel fell into deep thought. He had never questioned it. In Heisk's case, the first ability he got from her was ice control. It had evolved a few times, but it didn't change the fact that Heisk considered her ice as normal ice. There was also another question similar to it. Why would Heisk's control change its name to spiritual cold control? Did it mean Heisk's element was now a spiritual ice or cold? I think you should take a look at. He had never paid attention to the name change and the meaning behind those names this might be what his grandfather was implying, why undying fire, what is undying in the first place, Noel tried to recall the meaning of undying and thought, undying means lasting forever, wait a minute, lasting forever, Noel's body trembled, if the flame lasts forever, doesn't that mean the flame won't be able to change its attribute, if it can burn for thousands of years without me there, what kind of power does it have, if the flame burns everything, will it engulf this world with its power, how about its heat, what kind of impact does it bring, will the temperature remain the same, if the flame has a low temperature but can burn everything, there will be a lot of implications, for example, I can separate liquid by making one liquid into a vapor, but if the fire temperature is low, the liquid will only evaporate into nothing, in fact, not even the vape remains, on the other hand, if the fire temperature is high and maintained at that level, 
it will stay at that level until the end of time, that's the meaning of undying. In other words, the last requirement to mastering the undying fire is not control whatsoever, instead, it's the identity of the undying fire, what kind of fire do I want? Noel came to a realization. It turned out the problem was not an extraordinary challenge like he expected, it was actually the basic thing. He'd gotten the fundamentals wrong. And the reason why Ardagon didn't say the correct answer was because Ardagon wanted Noel to choose without influencing him in any way. Ardagon once explained that the spirits resided within the people because they wanted to see how the humans wielded their power, using it as an inspiration. Ardagon was the same. It wanted to see how Noel wielded him. Even Raincart could see this problem. Noel stopped responding to his grandfather as he was too engrossed with this new thought. He had to confirm what kind of flame he wanted from Ardagon and set it that way so that the undying fire could truly last forever, not change with the passage of time. Seeing his expression made Raincart feel relieved. Raincart didn't know anything about Noel's talent in spiritual energy or his conversion rate. In fact, having two spirits alone was enough to confirm his talent. However, Raincart could see that Noel's true talent was hidden in his mind. Noel's mind worked differently from normal people's. It was due to his past. He had been reading so many books in the past. People thought he was lazy. But his father never stopped him. Novelnext.com. There was one big reason. When reading those books, Noel's mind would often wander in his imagination of those books. That imagination had been trained since he was very young, and Noel wasn't disturbed by how the people described him. That was why when Noel faced a question, his mind would wander to all kinds of things. And the only thing people needed to do was to leave a single clue to narrow his imagination. He would come up with the answer himself. This was the hidden intention that his father had when training Noel. In the past, he never asked Noel to learn sword or business. Instead, he only taught him about morale and train of thought. In other words, his imagination, to think about the problem, come up with a solution, and execute the plan were something that people needed. And Noel could vividly imagine the scenario and the result. He might fail sometimes, like fighting against Lorfi or Alexander, but he took that experience for future choices. This time, Noel had been presented with a problem about his undying fire. Would he choose to let the fire burn without any heat? Would the flame lose its burning power in exchange for a natural power from the temperature and heat? Noel had to be the one to discover it. While Noel was tackling his current problem, Raincart moved away, curious about the disciple Noel took in. It was quite surprising to know that Tristan was a slave, but there must be a quality that Noel wanted from Tristan. By the time he learned about Tristan's extraordinary memory, he would be so excited that he bothered Noel for days. But that was for later. Noel was undergoing a transformation to reach the stage Anna stood on. He didn't plan to give the lead to her. Chapter 854 Progress In the garden located at the back of the Enham family, Noel had been meditating for a few hours. He was fully absorbed in the current problem, which was to determine the power of his flame. Raincart, who was watching from a distance, couldn't help but furrow his eyebrows. There was a spark of interest flashed in his gaze, but he contained that curiosity so as to not bother Noel. The black fire was gushing out of Noel's body. At first, it was a mild fire. There was no heat or whatsoever. However, the more time passed, the higher the temperature of the fire. They started feeling the intense heat even though they were standing 30 meters away. Even Raincart had to raise his guard against that fire, but it seemed that he didn't have to worry. Before it grew out of control, the fire temperature gradually decreased. Noel appeared to be having second thoughts about raising his fire temperature. Of course, it didn't mean that he would completely ignore the temperature. After some adjustment, the fire seemed to have stopped fluctuating. When the heat brushed Raincart's skin, he could roughly measure its temperature. Noel actually wanted to maintain the flame's behavior. Since it was the flame, it was obvious that it should have intense heat and high temperature. But the question was, how high? If he set it too high, the flame would destroy everything and become uncontrollable. Hence, 
he settled for two and a half times higher than the average flame. This should be enough to overwhelm any fire his opponent might have, even if they were quite extraordinary. After all, Noel had a few other properties to adjust on. Since the fire radiated the heat, he wanted to adjust the amount of heat. If the heat was too strong for the current temperature, it would become unstable. In addition, it would burn everything around it. At the same time, the fire couldn't be without heat. He thought that for an undying fire that would last forever. The sufficient heat would be two times more than normal, but he also made an adjustment with the temperature. This way, he wouldn't accidentally hurt his people when fighting around them. While he was a fighter, he was a lord. So, there was no way he would fight alone in the future. The flame began to swirl around Noel's body. It looked like the fire was eager to show its power, starting from burning the grass and soil. However, Noel immediately stopped it with his control because if he wasn't careful, he could easily burn the mansion behind him. It also reflected the possible future after becoming a noble. While Noel was adjusting his flame, Raincart got a guest. The guest was a middle-aged man. He had a straight posture and gallant figure. So, he is Layshaw's son. The man said, a bit surprised by what he saw from Noel. Even he felt some fear toward that flame. And after hearing about Noel's achievement, he might not be able to win against Noel once he becomes a spirit grandmaster. Indeed, Raincart nodded proudly. But don't take it to heart. He is just too irregular. You're already talented enough, and your children have nothing to worry about. Thank you, father. The man turned out to be Raincart's son, the current family head of the Enham family. But if I'm not wrong, Layshaw also. Yeah? He has inherited his mother's element as well. In other words, he has two spirits residing within his body. But it's even more surprising because those two spirits have opposite elements. The man thought for a moment and asked, those two elements are in harmony. How? Normally, if two opposite elements reside within a body, they would clash and end up harming its host. However, I could see that the flame, despite overbearing, is the one harmonizing the relationship between the two elements. What? Then, the flame is actually lowering its own property in order to match the ice? Yeah? But doesn't that mean the flame's full potential hasn't been released yet? The man gasped. Exactly. Yesterday, he asked me whether there is a way to procure an ice element item or herb and a large quantity of demon crystals. The man fell silent as something clicked in his mind. Father. The reasons for him to request those things. Might be for the flame development. Yeah? I'm thinking the same thing. If my prediction is correct, that ice spirit is trying to increase its power so that the flame can release its full potential. Actually, after he came here last time, I had been researching about the Ardagon family. If the record is correct, Noel actually possessed a similar if not the same spirit as his ancestor the same spirit that gave birth to the only spirit king in history. Raincart narrowed his eyes as his expression turned grim. What? Raincart asked. Can you help me procure those things? The man fell into deep thought, muttering. The demon crystals are not a problem. Even if those families feel something weird about our large purchase this time, I can fend them off. The problem is the ice element item. I think I have to ask an old friend to see if he has any clue or not. Raincart smiled. It wouldn't be weird if he felt awful after knowing that his nephew was as strong as him, but that assurance from Raincart indirectly implied that no matter how talented Noel was, he didn't belong to the Enham family, and that was enough. After some consideration, he stated, I think it's possible, but I need a few weeks to one month. Sure. Thank you. I think you should take a look at. He is my nephew. So of course, I will help him. Raincart patted his shoulder while walking away. He said, let's not disturb him. Just put some guards there to make sure that the fire doesn't reach the mansion. Where are you going, father? Novelnext.com. I'm going to visit another little devil. Raincart waved his hand while walking toward the mansion. That was right. Noel's talent was frightening but his eyes for talent were similar to his father's, 
The reason why the Ardagan family became the wealthiest family in the Muevel Kingdom was because Luke Ardagan managed to find a lot of excellent subordinates. They became the pillars of the family and made the territory prosperous. Raincart was heading toward Tristan's room. On the way, he could hear a maid shouting in anger. That's not it. Put your hands together and straighten your back before bowing. Just from those words alone. He knew what was going on. It was the voice of the head maid who was training Sandra on the etiquette required to become a maid. After a while, he opened the door and found Tristan inside. Now that they had reached the Enham family, there were a lot of resources that could be used to practice runes. On the corner of the room were a few bags of low-level demon crystals. Noel wanted Tristan to begin absorbing the crystals to build up his spiritual energy reserve even if he hadn't awakened his spirit, the runes were a method to fight without the spirit after all. During the day, Tristan would fully focus on drawing all kinds of arrays from his memory before matching them with the original, this way, he could see which stroke was too thick, too thin, or curved incorrectly. As a result, there were a few stacks of paper on his tables. Some of them had even dropped, but Tristan had no time to tidy it up yet. When the door was opened, Tristan's body shook as the last stroke became too long. Tristan raised his head, wondering who entered the room. Without hesitation, Tristan stood up and greeted him, Sir, you don't have to be that stiff. Raincart chuckled, It seems that you've been busy. How is your progress? I don't want to disappoint teacher. Tristan made a wry smile, he suddenly remembered that the paper was scattered on the ground and hurriedly said, I will clean this up immediately, it's fine, just let the maid do it, but, Tristan wanted to reject it, he felt weird asking the maid because the thought of being a slave was still stuck in his mind, your life is about to change, so you have to get used to it, in any case, how is your progress in runes, do you find anything you don't understand? I'm currently reviewing all the runes I can draw, so not yet. How about your spiritual energy? I have been absorbing the spiritual energy through the method you've taught me. I think I have managed to accumulate it a bit. But Master said I still didn't have enough to form a rune. Once I got enough, I would start creating runes with spiritual energy so that I didn't waste all these papers. Is that so? Raincart smiled while taking a glimpse of his works. Tristan's hands weren't that nimble yet, so the stroke felt a bit too stiff, it was bound to create some mistakes, still, this kind of progress was far faster than the average person, once he got the hang of it, he would progress by leaps and bounds, if you have any problems, just tell me about it, I'm also quite curious about the runes, so we might have some chats sometime in the future, yes, Sir, I will be very honored. Raincart patted his head while saying, Keep up with the good work. Don't disappoint your teacher. Tristan bowed his head as Raincart left the room. Surprisingly, a butler had been waiting outside the room. Raincart said, Help me tidy up the room. Yes, sir. The butler acknowledged the order, but before coming in, he whispered, You have a guest, sir. A guest? Yes. The guest is a bit special, so. Remembering that his son was helping him to bring the stuff Noel needed, Raincart nodded his head. I'll meet the guest. Chapter 855 After training, a burning noise echoed in the garden, the fire seemed to be burning the grass, but surprisingly, it didn't spread like a normal fire. The fire only moved toward a specific area and drew a pattern on the ground. After the last crisp sound vanished, the guy, who was sitting in the middle of the pattern, opened his eyes, he was none other than Noel. In the past three days, Noel had been adjusting the characteristics of his flame so that he could define it with precision, it was surprisingly harder than he thought, but Noel could see that the missing part he had felt before was getting filled up. As much as I want to continue, I don't think I can focus any further. I have to consider a few other things as well, so let's continue tomorrow. Noel took a glance at the sun's position. Fortunately, there were still two hours before dusk, so he stood up and gave a nod to the soldiers who had been protecting him the whole time. After seeing Noel leave the area, the soldiers made sure that there was no more fire before dispersing. It's been a while since Anna has become an arbiter, 
she should have made some foundation in her new post. As for me, I think I still need a few more days to finalize the concept of my flame. After that, I can begin my breakthrough to the spirit grandmaster, which shouldn't take more than three days. I have to teach Tristan as well, wait, there is also a spirit link and those awakening pills, if I have to sum everything up. I might need another two weeks before completing everything and another week to help grandfather. After that, I will return to the Muevil Kingdom and become a noble. Noel nodded in satisfaction. Since he had finished his training earlier than he expected, he wondered what he should do. Tristan should be in his room reviewing his works. Should I go to grandfather? Noel muttered while walking down the garden. On the way, he heard an energetic voice from the side. Oh. Is this it? As those words resounded, a fluctuation of spiritual energy occurred. This fluctuation was something Noel was familiar with. Rune? Noel raised his eyebrows and turned around, he didn't expect that someone from the Enham family had practiced a rune. Still, the Enham family was famous for producing an exceptional spirit magician, and with the fact that the author of the rune book was related to the Enham family, it was obvious that they would ask the people from the house to learn runes. So, Noel couldn't help but follow the voice, wondering who managed to use the runes. He might be able to teach her a little bit to repay everything that his grandfather had done for him this whole time. Novelnext.com After walking for several meters, he took a sneak peek from behind a tall bush to see who managed to use runes. The woman appeared to be 16 to 17 years old. She had long, wavy green hair. Surprisingly, there were a few ivy rising around her, those ivy formed a strength blessing rune. Noel observed her a bit further. She was wearing a one piece light blue sundress that reached up to her knees. It was normal for someone of a noble family, making Noel think that this person should be his cousin. Still, there was one thing that piqued his interest. The ivy was covered in thick energy, and the strength blessing rune, the simplest rune in the book, made the success more convincing. But, she is using the plants, her spirit should be a plant spirit. Noel frowned, the strength blessing is the easiest because the thickness in all strokes is basically the same. So, using ivy to form a rune is easy. But that method will cause problems if she attempts more advanced runes. Suddenly, the ivy was trembling and gently brushed the person's forehead. MHM? The woman immediately turned around as if she could tell what the ivy was trying to say. Even Noel was surprised that he was noticed by her. While he didn't erase his presence, he had made sure not to take any actions that would alarm her. It seemed that her plants could get the help of the ones around them to locate their target. When their gazes met, Noel made her eye smile while scratching the back of his head. Sorry. Did I disturb you? No, no. It's my fault for doing it here. The woman smiled gently. Is that rune? Noel asked. Yes. I have been into it for a while. The woman grabbed the book on the table and showed it to him. Do you have any interest in it too? You can consider it that way. Noel nodded and walked slowly, as expected. It was his rune book, that's great. I have been doing this by myself, so it would be great to have another person who has the same interest. Is that so? Noel finally arrived at the gazebo. I'm rather perplexed though. Is there anything I can help you with? I don't know much about runes, but please don't hesitate to ask. I'll answer if I can. Noel paused for a moment choosing words so as to not hurt this woman's heart. It seemed that she wasn't aware that he was the author of that rune book, but he didn't plan to brag either, he asked. Your spirit must be a plant type spirit, right? I'm wondering why you chose to create a rune with your ivy? Oh, she pointed at her ivy and explained, that's because I've been controlling my ability for a long time, so I'm more confident in handling it. To make her point. She waved her hands. The ivy began to spread, grab a few items, and stack them with precision. She must have used that plant for a few years, he thought. Still, it didn't change the fact that the ivy would have a problem replicating the more advanced runes. Yeah, that's what confuses me. I can see that the ivy is creating the runes. And you infuse your spiritual energy into the ivy to create the runes. In other words, 
it's not the ivy that is used to form the rune, but the energy within that ivy. She was dumbfounded. This was the first time someone managed to see through that trick. Is there a problem? Ah, I'm not trying to attack you or something. Noel shook his head and raised one finger. I'm just thinking, what will you do once you become more adept and create more advanced runes? For example, this rune. Noel raised his palm and controlled his spiritual energy to draw a muscle enhancement rune. The strokes were delicate, but if one took another look, there were a few strokes that almost touched each other. In other words, if she used the ivy, the ivy had to cross each other as the spiritual energy matched its shape. The contact between the stems would cause a disruption in the flow of energy. That's, the woman didn't have the answer to that problem. Of course, I'm not saying your method is wrong. Look, Noel started infusing his ice element to freeze the spiritual energy, this way. His ice would create the same rune, however, it couldn't be activated because the spiritual energy had been frozen. At first glance, you won't be able to activate the rune this way. But if you look at it from another perspective, don't you think that this ice can be used for training? The woman was confused, but upon looking at the pattern again, she understood his words. So, you're saying that the ice or plants can form the rune? Well. I can see that it's very effective for practice, especially drawing. But ultimately, the spiritual energy will be the one forming the rune. Yes, I have thought about the possibility of using my ability to form a rune, but the more advanced runes are stopping me from that. So, I chose to get used to the original method as soon as possible. Noel nodded. I see. I have never thought about that. The woman nodded in agreement. You're very knowledgeable about runes? Is that so? Noel smiled humbly. Yeah, you seem to be only one or two years older than me, but this is the first time someone has given me this suggestion. Well, I've been researching runes for a while, but I don't think my skill is that high. Noel chuckled. If I'm not wrong, the rune you created earlier is the muscle enhancement rune, right? Yes, you're definitely more skilled than me. The woman's eyes flashed as she couldn't help but ask, if you don't mind, can I ask you a few questions about runes? Sure, I'll give you the answer if I know about it. Without hesitation, the woman began talking about runes and showed the problem in her understanding. Noel took his time to learn about her mastery and offered some explanations for her problem. She was shocked because Noel felt like a teacher who taught her everything about runes. There was nothing she could refute in his explanation. Without them realizing it, the sky had turned orange. It was time for them to stop. Since the woman was a part of the Enham family, he thought that they would meet again. Hence, Noel stood up and said, I guess we'll have to stop here. A. Eh? Her body trembled as her eyes looked watery. She was reluctant to end their conversation here. But Noel only said, I have other things to do. Well. We can meet again at this place tomorrow, around the same time. Ah, she realized that she had been rude earlier. She hurriedly nodded her head, agreeing to the meeting. I'll definitely be here tomorrow. Then, see you tomorrow. M. Noel had just realized that he hadn't asked the other party's name this whole time. Maria, you can call me Maria. She immediately introduced himself to spare Noel from the awkwardness. See you tomorrow, Maria. Noel waved his hand and just walked away. Maria was silent for a while before realizing something important. Ah, I haven't asked his name either. I was too engrossed in the topic. Never mind. I'll meet him again tomorrow. Chapter 856 A Slight Bear How is your training going? Raincart asked while walking down the hallway with Noel the next day. Noel thought for a moment and said, I should be able to complete my training and do the rest in two weeks. I see. Tristan is doing well. And I'll be monitoring his study for now. So, you don't have to worry about him for now. Thank you. Noel nodded. His grandfather had been helping him this whole time. Even during the previous stay, he instructed him on a few tricks for controlling his ability. And he could make a breakthrough soon because of his advice. So. He felt indebted to him. Noel raised one finger, asking, Grandfather, do you mind if I teach someone the rune? Come on, are you thinking of owing me something? 
it's fine for a grandson to rely on his grandfather, besides, you're a responsible young man, so there's no need to feel that way. Raincart chuckled while patting Noel's head, well, if I teach someone runes, it will definitely be useful for the Enham family. Even if you don't want me to thank you in any way, how about accepting it for the sake of mother and father? I feel like they have owed you a lot. Raincart smiled gratified. He could see that Noel had grown upright, of course, he didn't have any intention of receiving the gift, but it seemed that Noel would be adamant about it. So, Raincart said, all right, you can do whatever you want. Actually, I saw a talented person in the family yesterday. She had a good understanding of runes and progressed very quickly, it's just. Noel stopped abruptly as if contemplating something, is there something wrong with her? Yeah? Noel nodded with a serious expression before asking with a worried tone. Do I have a cousin called Maria? Raincart became speechless in that instant. And that reaction was what Noel needed. He said, while I haven't eaten with the entire family this whole time, I'm still keeping track of the people inside this family, it's just. This is the first time I've seen her. Noel had expressed his suspicion. Even Raincart could see that Noel would have no trouble in seeing through his lies either. Raincart let out a long sigh, saying, No, you don't have a cousin called Maria. Then, who is she? Noel frowned, feeling something weird about the whole situation. Her real name is Livia. Livia, which Livia? Noel tilted her head in confusion, but after seeing Raincart's troubled face, Something clicked in his mind. Wait a minute. Are you talking about Livia de Greenwood? Raincart nodded his head helplessly. Don't tell me. Noel clicked his tongue, annoyed. But Raincart added, no. She is not aware of your identity or any of this scheme. After his majesty heard about your disciple, he sent her to this family in order to become your disciple. She is extremely talented and can learn a lot from you. This means she will become the leading rune master in the kingdom. Still, Noel wanted to rebuke him, but he suddenly fell silent as though there was another idea flashed in his mind. I think taking her as your disciple is not that bad either. I mean, I taught the current king, so it wouldn't be weird if my grandson did the same to a royal princess. Besides, there are several advantages you can get. It appeared that Raincart wasn't aware of this scheme until the princess arrived at his family. But after thinking about it, Raincart deemed that there were things that could be taken advantage of. Noel asked, is there any condition? It's actually at your discretion. As long as she is safe, everything is fine. Noel asked, that means I can demand a lot of things from him? Yes. He won't interfere with your teaching. I believe you can see through his intentions. Let her become my disciple and learn runes from me directly. He should be able to see the potential from Damien's result alone, so following me for a few years will give a far bigger result than that. And there is a possibility that he is trying to make her close to me so that I can fall for her or something. You're truly my grandson. Raincart nodded in agreement. Still, there should be a tuition fee, right? Noel smirked. Dot, I think you should take a look at. Raincart's serious expression turned into a sly face. He said, Don't worry, I'm going to extort him for you. You can get all the demon crystals you need to break through to Spirit Grandmaster, including that ice element item. Of course, I will definitely add a lot more crystals for your soldiers. The serious conversation earlier had turned into a cunning conversation between two sly foxes. Novelnext.com. Noel added, but I still have a condition. I am still going to ask her to do everything and I even want to create a rune school in my territory. You don't have to worry about that. Just say that it's for her training and everything is settled. Don't forget that she is known to be extremely smart. She is also a team leader in the Royal Magician Bureau. Her control over her element should be higher than you. There are also several achievements under her belt. As a person alone, she is talented enough to help you manage the territory. And she is only 17 years old. Still, she has to go back to marry, no? It's her royal duty. Actually, you don't have to care about that. His majesty has considered her to be more useful to let her do whatever she wants instead of burying her under the political marriage. Well. If she can achieve all that when she is only 17 years old, 
her achievement would be boundless when she is older, Noel agreed with Raincart and the king's opinion, still, it's annoying to talk to her politely, say her name again, Raincart shook his head, Livia, no, Maria, Noel raised his eyebrows, finally understanding why she had given that false name, that's right, what you're going to bring is Maria, not Livia de Greenwood, you can treat her the same, I see, Noel fell into deep thought, on the one hand, he was a bit annoyed that the king decided to employ this move, on the other hand, he could see a lot of benefits by taking her as his disciple, Raincart raised one finger, actually, there is one more reason why I want you to accept, MHM, Noel was confused, he tried to come up with an answer, but he couldn't find any other reasons, however, Raincart was an old noble, he had more experience than him as a lord, so, Raincart said, the Atrukka kingdom's second prince had gone too far, how dare he extorted my grandson with that opportunity, Raincart's eyes were emitting killing intent as if he was ready to skin him alive, he added, Noel, don't forget that you will be a noble, I can see that you have integrity, after hearing your story, I know that you will be trusted since you always deliver your promise, however, if you just let them extort you without paying any consequences, you will be looked down upon, my grandson is not a pushover, Noel's body couldn't help but tremble, Raincart's tone was strict yet protective, even if the other party was a prince, Raincart wasn't afraid, this shows how much Raincart cared for Noel, even Noel reconsidered his approach, just like Raincart said, if this matter was known to other nobles, they would simply pull off their trade after he delivered his side of the agreement, his strength could somehow scare them, but it didn't change the fact that he looked like a pushover, and Raincart didn't want Noel to be looked down on by everyone, with his experience as the head of the Enham family, he explained, by taking the second princess of the Greenwood Kingdom, you are showing to the Atrika Kingdom that they have lost their chance, in other words, you can give those tips and tricks about runes to the second prince, but you can also give a letter of dissatisfaction to their grand protector, just tell him that he is disappointed and only took a slave from his country as his disciple instead of any important people, and her highness Livia is that living proof, you should be able to see what kind of thing will happen in that country, right, Noel shivered just from that thought alone, in a battle, he was smart and experienced, but Raincart was a veteran in a political battle, after doing those two things, the Grand Protector would unleash his anger toward the second prince, after all, Tristan had proven to be more trustworthy than their second prince, meanwhile, the Greenwood Kingdom had a better approach and ended up with their second princess becoming Noel's disciple, Tristan wouldn't go back to the Atrukka Kingdom, while Livia would still give a lot of knowledge and information even if she didn't return, their second prince simply chose a box of gold in front of him compared to the numerous diamonds he could get along the way, it was clear who was smarter and better, but won't that cause an international problem, wait a minute, Noel stopped talking, the second princess is going to prevent that from happening, that's right, with her highness Livia being your disciple, if the second prince or the Atresca kingdom decided to attack you out of spite, not only the Muvel kingdom, but the Greenwood Kingdom will also stop them, I see, Noel agreed with this solution, but he noticed one more hidden intention, don't you think the Zecuria Kingdom will see all this, exactly, they don't want to follow the Atrika Kingdom's move and decide to approach you with a peaceful method, you can simply promise them related stuff to your own schools, which allows you to gain a lot of resources from the Zecuria Kingdom, this will prove to be useful for your development, right, indeed, I have to fight the royal family and the supreme devil organization so I can get all the support I need just by taking her as my disciple, and with that big movement, other nobles won't be able to look down on me as well, if the organization is trying to harm Olivia, the Greenwood Kingdom will wreak havoc, Noel had learned a lot from this brief exchange alone, this was the first time he learned anything related to politics from an experienced figure, even his father only told him philosophy, while strength might indeed be the most important factor in a duel, sometimes, they could avoid all kinds of problems just by taking a step back, 
they wouldn't be seen as a tyrant who shut people's mouths with their strength as well. After a brief consideration, Noel whispered something to Raincart. The latter considered Noel's suggestions and whispered another thing. It seemed that they were satisfied with that arrangement as both of them gave a thumbs up with a sly smile on their faces. It was clear that they were truly blood related. Chapter 857 Accepting Another One Two hours before dusk, Livy or, as she introduced herself, Maria was waiting for the mysterious person that taught her yesterday. There were two books sitting on the table this time. One of them was the rune book that Noah wrote while the other one was her notebook. MHM, MHMMM. -M -M. She was humming heavily while reading the rune book. I wonder how the author can write all these things? While it looks like the spirit enchantments are the downgraded versions of runes, it's still impossible to find all these completed runes. There are a lot of runes that have to be researched first, including the ones without any records from the spirit enchantment. It's a completely new area, but it appears that the runes want everyone to be able to fight against their opponent without relying on the spirit. While the spirits play a big part in one's power, if there is a rune master, who can form runes, at fast speed, they would be able to contend against them. Of course, from what I can see, the rune power is only limited to spirit practitioner, no, spirit wielder, it doesn't have anything stronger to harm a spirit master or above. All of a sudden, a gentle voice echoed in her ears, that's not true, exclamation mark Livia widened her eyes in surprise, this time, Noel had moved so fast that her plants couldn't detect him, sorry if I startle you, Noel chuckled before raising a finger, but I don't lie about that, there are stronger runes, because all these runes are the basic form, huh, the shock turned into confusion, how could Noel know about such a thing, even the Greenwood Kingdom needed a lot of research before they could prove that theory, Noel sat down on the opposite side and asked, since you're in this house, you're my cousin, right, to thank my grandfather, I want to teach someone from this family about runes, thank your grandfather, cousin, Livia made her eye smile, she almost forgot that before coming here, her father asked her to act as a part of the Enham family and stay for a while, although she didn't know why he wanted her to act that way, she still had to follow his instructions, she nodded her head, saying, yes, so, I'll be teaching you about runes during my stay here, Noel smiled before forming a rune blast, this is what I mean by those runes are the basic form, exclamation mark Livia widened her eyes in shock when she saw the rune on Noel's hand, she rose from her seat just so that she could lean forward to take a closer look, what is this rune, it's far more complicated than the ones in the book, when she traced the strokes on each rune, she said, this is, it consists of at least 50 more lines than the runes in the book, the spiritual energy contained in each line is also twice, if not three times stronger, with each line that strong, the power that it can exert is at least a hundred times greater than the basic runes, it's possible to harm a spirit master or even a spirit grandmaster with this rune, as one would expect from the second princess, her reputation was truly well deserved, she managed to assess the runes in just a short time, while her talent was different from Tristan's, her talent still suited the runes, Noel nodded his head and continued with the explanation, the spirit enchantment is only one of the uses of the runes, there are several other ways to utilize the runes, for example, you can form the runes like this and apply it, right? and there are things that can be summoned and controlled by using runes like this, Noel changed his rune into rune sword, as a result, a sword created by pure spiritual energy, floated above the rune, it began flying around as if it was alive, Livia couldn't believe what she saw, she had never thought that the runes could be used like this, even Damien didn't tell her anything about this type of rune, how do you know about all this, wait, that's a foolish question, Livia couldn't believe it, but the proof was right before her eyes, there was no one who understood the runes other than the author of the rune book himself, he had shown her all the hints contained in those advanced runes and knowledge, there was no need to introduce himself, 
Livia shivered, recalling all the questions she had yesterday. While the questions weren't that weird, her eagerness somehow made her embarrassed. She said, I apologize for my rudeness yesterday. No, Mr. Noah Lardigan. Really? Hasn't Noah Lardigan died in the Muvel Kingdom? Noel chuckled. That's what has been known. But they haven't received any report about your body, meaning that there is no proof. Damien's got a lot of important knowledge just by following a man called Iadera, and with the relationship between the Ardagan family and the Enham family, it's no wonder you call Sir Aincart, your grandfather. If I link everything, it won't be hard to deduce that you're the real Noel Ardagan. Sir Aincart, Noel squinted his eyes, judging Livia, if she wanted to show that she was a part of the Enham family, she shouldn't have addressed him that way. But Livia actually placed her hand on her chest while saying with a calm tone, Yes, I wasn't aware of the reason why I sent it here. But after knowing that the real Noah Lardigan is currently staying in this mansion, everything is clear. I believe it is rude for me to hide my identity anymore. Despite the fact that you will have the chance to become my student and learn a lot of things about runes as Maria, Noah asked, slightly impressed by her action. If I continue as Maria, I might be able to get all that. However, as soon as you find out, not only you but the Enham family will dislike the royal family. Then, does that mean you're going to leave right now and just step away from this opportunity? Noel asked another question. Livia shook her head. After realizing my father's intention, I don't think I can back away. You should know that I've made an agreement with the Greenwood Kingdom previously. And our relationship is just a mere business partnership. Yes, however, I believe that taking me in will prove to be advantageous to your position. Livia and Noel stared at each other. The former tried to explain the reason despite fully knowing that Noel wanted to accept her. On the other hand, Noel was questioning her despite already agreeing to the arrangement. So, are you planning to force your way to become my student? A royalty becoming the student of a commoner? Noel smirked. This was a tricky question. However, Livio actually went beyond Noel's imagination. I believe that words alone won't be sufficed. Livia suddenly lowered her head and stated, Please let me become your student, Mr. Noel. Exclamation mark Noel was dumbfounded. A noble had their dignity to maintain, so they couldn't bow to the commoners easily. However, the royalty was even stricter about this. After all, the royalty carried the pride of the entire kingdom. If they lowered their heads easily, the entire kingdom would become a laughing stock. Yet, the second princess, who had a lot of achievements and represented the kingdom far better than some princes or princesses, actually lowered her head to plead to Noel to take her in. This showed enough of her determination. She stripped away her pride and lowered herself down to the very bottom just to become Noel's disciple. It was a hard thing to do even for a noble let alone a princess. Noel could finally see the real reasons for the second princess achievements. He raised one finger. Even if I'm planning to become a noble, I'm still a commoner. Don't you think your action is a bit excessive? If my action can let my kingdom prosper, I won't hesitate to do it. But I would be lying if I said I don't have any interest in it either. Livia took a deep breath and expressed her real intention. Why do we have to be bound by our social stratification when our home is threatened? Why do humans have to fight against each other when we have one common enemy? Pride, greed, lust, or whatever. It can be used as a reason, but while we're fighting among ourselves, the demons are still going to hunt us. The nobles can wield their power and wealth to assemble a lot of people to protect them. The royalty can escape easily with the power they have, but the common people can only accept their death if the demons attack us with their full force right now. If lowering my pride or even sacrificing my life is the only price, I think it's pretty cheap. That's why Livia lowered her head again. Please accept me as your disciple. I wish no more than the common people to have the power to fend for themselves. Noel was amazed by her speech. This was the first time he found someone who directed their attention not on the people, but on the demons. As she said, the demons were their common enemy. Novelnext.com. Noel naturally knew this, but he was still a human, he asked. 
Are you trying to force me to accept you for the sake of morality? If morality could be used on everything, the royal family wouldn't have executed my parents. I'm aware. I will do my best to satisfy all your conditions. All my conditions? Noel squinted his eyes while scanning her body. Livy understood that gaze, but she didn't have any change of expression. Yes. Please put any conditions. Even Noel was speechless about this determination unless he directly rejected her. No, even if he rejected her, she would continue pestering him in the future. It seemed that the most dangerous thing was not the royal family's scheme but to actually meet her in person. It was because she was this kind of person that the king was convinced that his plan would succeed. I guess I haven't learned enough about people's characters. Noel could only sigh at his mistake while adding, Fine. I will accept you as my student. I'm planning to open a rune school as soon as I become a noble anyway. However, I have several conditions for you to fulfill. I understand. Please state them. I'll do my best to satisfy all of it. I'll just write it down. In the past, Noel had been showing his determination, plan, and courage to get people's approval like Dimitri, Harley, or other pillars of the Ardigan family but this was the first time he was moved by someone's determination. Title, Weapon Seller in the World of Magic, 434-447, by Snowstar, Chapter 434, Unveiling Midnight Encounters, Genesis Weapon Store, A. Y. Xeben was taken aback as she was suddenly informed that they were leaving the city for good. She was someone who grew up in the mountains and rarely stepped out of the sect. The teenager liked this bustling city and she often goes out to walk, and now, she hears that they were moving to a secluded island that has no human population. Obviously, she didn't like it, but, will Mark cares about her opinion? Naturally, he won't. He straightforwardly said to her, you can stay here with Alan if you want. I don't intend to close down the store anyways. Fine. You are the husband and the head of the family. Wherever you go, I have to follow, replied the teenager as she sat down. Mark was irritated at her comment and he warned her, although not in a serious tone, I believe we have an agreement that you won't address yourself as such until you were an adult. In the event you break the agreement, I can kick you out, remember? Eek. As Xeem sprung up on her feet and hurriedly replied that she will not leave. Song intervened and nicely told him not to tease her before informing her that they weren't actually living on an island but will be shifting their new residence to the Lunaries city. Ah, that's where your second wife lives, commented Xim in realization. Mark couldn't help but frown when he heard that. She isn't my wife, Xim, but will become one day, right? Countered the teenager. Mark then argued, yes, but when it happens, you can address her that way. Until then, she is the princess of the Western Moon Kingdom. Xeem stayed silent for a couple of seconds before asking Song, Sister, I really want to ask something. Are you really comfortable with your Marky? I mean lose and to have another wife. As Song hesitated slightly, Mark replied in her place, She is the one who convinced me to marry Princess Shim. Yeah, Song mumbled while nodding slowly. However, her expression was slightly uncomfortable. Maybe. Her growing attachment to Mark made her regret such a decision. Lately, it was then, Mark added, but then again, my marriage with Xin Ling is purely business. You can think of it like a business partnership. Even if I marry someone else in the future, it will be the same. Song is the only one I love and I intend to stay that way. So, you two should forget about your ambitions for the marriage, kid. I'm not a kid. I'll turn 16 within a few weeks. Xim almost screamed at Mark as she gets irked whenever he calls her that. She further added with a challenge, and just you wait, I'll make you will fall head over heel for me and follow me like a puppy. Ha! Wishful thinking, pancake. See, I knew you adore me or else, why do call me by your favorite breakfast dish? You should stop denying it and marry me, okay? No, I actually meant something else. And you should stop irritating me or else, I will really send you back to your home. Blair, our destinies are tied. You are not going to send me away. Destinies? What bullshit? As Mark and Xim continue to bicker as usual and making the atmosphere quite lively, 
Song shook her head with a smile and went upstairs to pack her clothes. The afternoon passed away and the darkness took over the vermilion bird continent. The manticore, Xim, Song, and the golden kitten got into the vehicle. Mark gave a hug to his beloved android and said, Alan, I leave this store in your hands. Once everything is finished as I planned, you may join me. Until then, take care of yourself. I know you can manage it on your own but it is best if you hire someone so that you also won't get bored to be alone. You have unlimited access to my inventory. So, don't need to wait for my permission to spend money or take out the goods to sell. Affirmed, replied Mark with a salute. Mark then got onto the driver's seat and drove away from the vehicle. Alan waved his hands as a gesture of goodbye, and once the vehicle is out of his sight, he let out a deep sigh like a human and looked at the sky. I hate times like this. It would be nice if there's indeed a person whom I can talk to without feeling uncomfortable. The image of a person came to his mind and he mumbled, I wonder what Sister Gzwe is doing right now? It's been a while since I last her. After that fiasco, we haven't met again. Let's go and meet her in the morning. A few hours later, Alan was walking back and forth in the upstairs living room while keep glancing at the wall clock. It's still 12.30. There are five more hours to go. As an android, he never needs to sleep. And previously, when he is a rank 5 android, he was more of a robot than a human. His thoughts weren't complicated. He could just stay sit in a spot for hours without thinking of anything. Now, after getting upgraded to rank 8, he has all the emotions that a human has. It's like he is a human born in the body of an android. He cannot sit still. He has massive data in his core and it was keep running, not letting him sit in peace. Not being able to resist the urge to see his only human friend, outside the Genesis Weapon Store family, Alan left the residence and flew to the inner sector. Because he is an android and lacked any traditional cultivation, he won't be sensed by any experts around. However, if he flies too fast, the sonic boom generated by him will cause disturbance and he doesn't want to be caught by anyone's vision. Hence, he flew at a slow pace and it took almost 30 minutes to reach Lin Yu Ying's mansion. He came here many times and even knew what room at what residence his friend sleeps. Of course, even if he has no knowledge of it, there shouldn't be a problem. His hypersensors could spot her in an instant. Alan slowly intruded into the house and reached Ling's room, which was surprisingly lit up. The time was around 1 a.m. and Ling still appeared to be awake. She was seriously writing something in a notebook. At first, Alan planned to knock, but intending to surprise her, he scanned the room and saw that a window is opened. He flew around and then went in through the window, only to land on the bed and alerted her due to the creaking sound of the bed. As Lynx abruptly turned around and saw Alan, she almost screamed, all N. She managed to control her voice with a look of surprise on her face. What are you doing here? She asked curiously before suddenly remembering the fact that he is a high quality puppet of the weapon seller just like Alina. Depression took over her instantly before anger replaced it. Mark then said, I'm here to see you. Oh, around one o'clock? Ling's expression changed and she acted coldly towards him. Chapter 435, Shattered Illusions. Alan's awakening to Ling's true feelings. It was the first time Alan saw coldness from a Ling's. He was familiar with her cold personality, but she never acted this way toward him. She was always warm and friendly. He doesn't know why she appeared angry. Maybe, is it because he disturbed her when she was in the middle of some important issue? Alan learned from Mark that he cannot just come to a conclusion based on a woman's behavior. Analyzing won't work for some women as their actions don't have logic. Alan wondered whether Lingz was one such woman. As he was busy thinking about the perfect reply, Lingz then spoke, I asked you a question. Mr. Alan, why are you here at this hour? Mr. Alan, the android was surprised once again but remembering Mark's teachings, he put away his analysis and went directly to the matter, trying to be as honest as possible. He explained, Sister, I'm actually not sure about it, my big bro and the others have left the city and I was alone. You came to my mind and I felt like it has been a long time since we talk. So, I, so, 
you thought you could just intrude into our residence, into my room, in the middle of the night, huh? Lingz continued to respond to him coldly. After a brief pause, she further added a comment, no wonder you could do it. After all, you are a puppet, not a human. If you are one, you would be able to have a sense of decency that you shouldn't intrude into a girl's room at such an hour. Eh? How did you? Alan was shocked this time as Lingz wasn't supposed to know his secret. But then, he remembered the fight with Necromancer and everything that happened with Arlena and all. He realized that maybe this is why she was angry at him. Making an apologetic face, he said, I don't mean to hide the truth from you, but, my big bro has ordered me to keep my secret and I don't want to disappoint him. I know. After all, you won't hesitate to kill me if your big bro orders you, replied the Lin clan heiress, blaming Mark in her mind. She then said, Anyways, since you are already here, let me be clear. I no longer hold any interest in seeing you or holding any conversations with you. Leave this instant. No, it is not true. Alan tried to clear things up for his friend now that she knows his secret. The past me might kill you if I get an order, but, now, I'm upgraded several times. I can resist his order and you are a special person to me. There's no way I will hurt you and let you get hurt if I had to oppose my big bro. Hearing his honest words only made Lynx more emotional. In her frustration, she growled at Alan. Why can't you just understand my words properly? I don't want to talk to you. I will shout if you stay here anymore. No matter how strong you are, people still think that you are the younger brother of Lu Zen. His fame will be the one that gets hit. Your store's fame will also get hit if they know you are abusing your strength to harass a woman. Okay, I will leave as you wish and I don't even show my face to you any longer. Don't need to threaten me. Alan raised his hands like he surrendered or something, however, he didn't turn and leave right away as he could sense her emotions through his hypersensing abilities. Alan pressed her to convince him by arguing, I just needed an honest answer. Why? Is it really matter if I'm a puppet? Do I become ineligible to talk to you or become your friend? After my last upgrade. I can now fly and travel distances faster than a supersonic jet. I have all the emotions that any human on this planet has. I'm now strong enough to go toe to toe against any supreme realm expert. I failed to protect you back then but if I face the necromancer king again, I can defeat him. I can now even help you accomplish your dream. You can become one with the sword. I can scan the surroundings to spot any hidden treasures or mines. I can make the finest sword that a dwarf could ever make. With my abilities, I can earn money more than all the noble clans combined. I'm better than 99.99999% of all the humans on this planet. And apart from once that happened as my big bro wanted you to stay away from his affairs, I had never mistreated you ever since we met. Do all of my qualities amount to nothing if I don't possess a human body and soul? I saved your life once. If you want to burn the bridges, then, give me the truth. Alan didn't know it himself but he looked quite frustrated as he was explaining to Lynx. Did her rejection really vex him that much? Who knows. However, Lynx was even more frustrated than him. In the end, she exploded as the tears welled up in her eyes. You want the truth, right? Then. Hear it. I fell in love with you, bastard. And you turned out to be a fucking puppet. It is unbearable for me to even look at you. Can you understand what I am going through? You have abilities? Okay, they might suit a bodyguard or an adventurer or some other profession. Sure, you can earn loads of money but can you really love someone? Can your heart beat for someone when you don't even have a heart? Can you marry someone and have kids? Can a girl imagine a future with you? Loving you is more disgusting than falling in love with an intelligent beast species. You are not even he or she. You are a thing. Now, you are a super fast analyzer, right? Then, try to think how a girl like me should feel when she falls in love with someone for the first time in her life. She wanted to share her life with you and then finds out that it is nothing but an illusion. Now, do you get it? Get it? She almost roared at his face looking at him in deep hatred while waking up everyone from the household. As people rushed to her room, Alan stood there like a statue, 
he was truly shocked to hear it. He doesn't have any personal experience but he does see what it means by falling in love and what it means by imagining a future together. His master's love for Song is the best example of that. As Lings collapsed on the floor and bawled as if her beloved died or something, Alan looked at her in a daze and mumbled without knowing, So, everything is going to be all right between us if I become a human? Lings raised her head and looked at him. She felt as if he was mocking her intelligence. Lings lunged at him and grabbed his collar while pushing him away slowly. Yes, go and become a human. Tell your dear bro to turn you into a human. I'll marry you even if you stay as a slave for losing your whole life. Leave. Knock knock knock. Xiaogs, are you alright? Who are you shouting at? Open the door. I'm breaking it now. The doors were knocked at that time and she heard his father's voice. My father is here. Leave. Lings was alarmed and she suddenly talked in a whisper, hurriedly sending away Alan. Once, Alan jumped out of the window and flew into the sky in a daze. She wiped her tears and turned around, telling him to give her a second. As she opened the door, she saw his father along with a couple of servants were there standing outside. He stepped inside and looked around. What happened? Nothing, replied Lings in a hoarse voice. Lin Yu Aing then looked at her face. You are crying. Are you all right? As he touched her face, it felt hot. He then touched her forehead. You have a fever. He turned his head and shouted, Bring the physician right now. As one of the servants left, Lin Yu Aing took her to the bed and let her sit before he kneeled to her height and asked, What is it that about? Did you have a nightmare? Lings nodded thrice in silence not intending to explain to her father. Lin Yu Aing smiled as he patted her head. It's probably because you hold yourself up for several days. You are probably scarred because of the Necromancer King. To defeat it, you must go out and roam. As Lings nodded, Lin Yu Aing sighed as he sat down. Today also has been hectic for me. First Tona lose accusation against the Emperor, then. The Emperor's retirement announcement. Sigh. Uncle Shang's retirement? Meanwhile, Alan was flying in the air, trying to digest her questions. On the way to his home, he questioned even himself whether he could really do what a girl expects of him. Unfortunately for him, he is an android and everything is usually based on logic. Why he stays loyal to Mark, it is because he is his creator, although the system is considered his parent. But, why does he act too desperate to save his friendship? Is it really because she is the only friend he had or is it something else? Is there a possibility that he too likes Lings the same she liked him once? There are too many things and Alan couldn't come to a conclusion for some reason. Maybe, he gets the answer if he is a human. Thought the Android. Chapter 436 Wedding Whispers Plans for a Destination Celebration the next day morning. Royal Palace. Lunaries City, Western Moon Kingdom. Welcome, Lord Lu, Lady Song, and the honored guests, to Lunaries City. Your presence in my palace is a great honor, may our alliance bring prosperity to both our families. The King of Western Moon, Shen Lu, accompanied by his daughter, courtiers, and officials, greeted the guests with a formal deep bow showing reverence and acknowledging their presence. Mark and Song respond bows with equal respect. If this was any other normal visit, such formality was unnecessary. But, since it holds special significance, the king treated Mark already as his son-in-law and gave him the respect he deserves. Following the formal greetings and rituals, King Shenu led the guests in a majestic procession through the palace, showcasing the grandeur and splendor of his kingdom. Courtiers and attendants follow along, adding to the sense of importance and celebration. It is not the first time Mark and Song were visiting the palace but as agreed upon beforehand, they played along. Only Xim was new and as a person who never stepped inside a royal palace, she was quite overwhelmed with their wealth. Not knowing that Mark once held more wealth than the combined wealth of the Western Moon Kingdom's citizens but blew it up all on weapon transmutation skill. Once it was over, everyone was given their own guest room to take rest until lunchtime. Xim slept peacefully all night while they were on the way but Song sept Mark company, talking with him so that he don't sleep on the way and their vehicle crashed into some tree or rock. 
Now, Mark has 9.6 points of strength, 9.5 temporary points of intelligence, and 9.1 points of resistance his physical and mental stamina is over the roof. He doesn't get tired that easily and neither could he feel much stress unless it deeply affects his soul, meaning emotional things related to his heart. However, Song doesn't have such resistance. The moment she stepped into her room, she collapsed on the bed and fell into a deep sleep while sharing the room with the manticore and the golden kitten, which constantly act as her bodyguards. As for her real bodyguard, aka her dad who disguised as the Black Knight warrior, he too couldn't properly sleep in a sitting position as Xim, hence, he also fell asleep as his back hit the comfy bed, and if one wonders whether Zheng was, the Beast Emperor continued his stay at Mount Lan and temporarily stayed away from Mark. Xim took out her griffin for a walk as they roamed outside of the palace while Mark was in a private meeting with Shenu and Xin Ling in his room. Okay, son, let me go through what we have discussed through the communication scroll over the past few days. King Shenu started speaking first, directly going through the matter. Meanwhile, Mark was also slightly surprised at Shenu's change of address toward him as it is the first time he called him like that, but he didn't mind it and listened to the king in silence. The coronation of Feng Chun is going to happen the day after tomorrow, hence, I have to leave by tomorrow noon. Xiao Ling will stay here. As you know, we don't have any specific ministries or departments to handle the marriage and other ceremonies. We hire private individuals who we call event planners to do them, they will take care of everything. Anyways, we hired Yang Tao, you can discuss the dates and venues and everything with him regarding your marriage with Lady Song and then your engagement with my daughter. And then, wait a second. Mark stopped him from going further as he wanted to say something regarding his marriage. Hmm, what is it? He asked. Xin Ling, who was just smiling in silence, also couldn't help but curiously look at Mark, wondering what he wants to say. Mark then said, there's a slight change in the plans actually. After discussing it a bit, we realized it is better if my marriage with Song happened somewhere else. Where? Xin Lu asked. Before Mark answered, Xin Ling said in a bit of an unsure tone, Eastern Sun Kingdom? Mark asked curiously, did Song tell you that? Xin Ling shrugged her shoulders, just a hunch, backed by a couple of theories. Mark stared at her for a couple of seconds and got back to her father as he doesn't want her to explain her theories, at least not in front of her father. As Xin Lu wondered why, Mark then explained that Song isn't comfortable with both events being attended in the same place without much gap between them. Hence, he decided to have a destination wedding with Song Wat Eastern Sun but omitted the location, making them assume that it is Helio's city. Shen Nu felt weird and didn't know what to reply to that, thinking of this destination wedding, far away from their hometown. He could understand if Mark wanted to marry at the Fujian Island since it is legally his own property, but at Eastern Sun Kingdom? That far away? Why? The only reason he could think is because of the current situation at Western Yan and the Phoenix Empire. Mark then further said that two three months after the completion of his first marriage, they can proceed through engagement or marriage with Xin Ling as the king wishes. Mark's assurance about his marriage to the princess brought a bit of relief and a boost of energy to King Shinnu once again and the latter continued with his explanation about their schedule, anyway, once the Western Yan is formally declared as the independent kingdom, we will proceed with implementing this embassy system and make sure to propose this system to the other powers who will attend the ceremony, coming to yourself, for the next few days. Xiao Ling will be responsible for taking care of you and your companions, she will let you know everything you have to know about our kingdom and our royal affairs. After that, I expect you to train the soldiers for a week regarding your firearms and vehicles as you have promised, then, you can go and tour around these s strips and runways that you wanted. Whatever place you want, we will make the arrangements, regarding the world auction. We still have to wait for the announcement but as we know, the sellers usually have 10 weeks of time to register their items from the date of announcement. So, 
I guess we have plenty of time. You can use this time as an opportunity to marry Lady Song within the next couple of months and then we can proceed with my daughter's engagement after the auction. It's just a suggestion. Not pressuring you by any means. Mark thought about it, taking the matter rather seriously. To be honest, he doesn't want to think about the marriage until he moved on from his revenge. He wanted it to be something like opening a new chapter of life. For that to happen, he needed a civil war to start in the Phoenix Empire, to get the desired results. He estimated about five to six months of time, but, this King Shinnu was trying to rush his marriage with Song so that he can get his daughter to wed him. What should he do? Chapter 437, Unleashing Ambitions and Mechanical Disappointments. After much thinking, Mark decided to rush his plans too. First of all, he cannot keep Shang Zhao hostage for too long. He never knows if Lan Jin Yi suddenly loses her patience. Secondly, there is a high chance that things might get cooled down if he gives too much time for Phoenix Empire to recover before he left. He did hear of the announcement made by the Emperor. Mark assumed it might be because of his allegations but he didn't have any pity for his biological father anyway. In fact, he thought this is a perfect opportunity. For the civil war to happen, Shang Zexi cannot win the race at all costs. But, he cannot lose by extreme either. The crown prince should feel like he has a strong chance. As long as he loses by a tiny margin and Shang Wei ends up being a winner. Mark felt like he could support the crown prince in the shadows through funding and breaking up the military. Once Shang Zexi emerged as a strong opposition, he will reveal the truth about the new emperor Shang Wei. Neither the primitive thinking ministers nor a proud person like Shang Zexi would ever accept an illegitimate child to sit on the throne. As the hell breaks loose at the southern empire, Mark will rake in money while supplying weapons to both parties. He will have his revenge and money at the same time, like hitting two birds with one stone. However, there's also another problem, which is the fact that Shang Zexi and Shang Wei are still brothers who grow up together. They might have rivalry but didn't have hatred against each other. If they have strong hatred, then, Shang Zexi would have a strong motive to overthrow his brother even if he has to destroy his own empire in the process. But, what can spark such hatred? Mark wondered. He had a few thoughts like staging an assassination attempt on the crown prince, abducting the crown prince's wife, creating rumors like the crown prince turned out to be impotent, etc. He wants to have a strong emotion of hatred from the crown prince. After thinking for a bit, a familiar face came to Mark's mind. A smile appeared on Mark's face as he thought, N.I.E. Rugang. N.I.E. Ru Gang is someone who is a strong player in politics and he was cherished by the crown prince too much. To save him, the proud Shang Zexi bowed his head before Mark in front of everyone without being ordered. Mark decided to target the man who he didn't like either. Seeing Mark deep in his thoughts and then have an evil smile made the father and daughter wonder what was going on in his mind. But, they remained patient until he was done with his thinking. In the end, he apologized and then further said to King Shinnu that he will keep his suggestion in mind when taking the decision. After sending away both of them with an excuse that he need to take a light nap, Mark closed the door and lay on the bed as if he was sleeping. But, in reality, he isn't. He spoke to the system, open Mark's factory. Mark's factory. Level, 4, available machines. Drill press, 10, welder, 10, milling machine. 10, lathe, 10, weighing and measuring equipment, blender, grain forming machine, curing machine, and computer numerical control machine, CNC. Available time, 240 minutes. Cool down, 6 hours. Computer aided design software, CAD, testing ground, analysis LV2. It was leveled up automatically when the system was upgraded and there was new equipment added for his next level of manufacturing. He has ideas to make new guns but his eyes were set on something else. Taking out a few destroyed robots and robot dogs on the floor, Mark flexed his fingers and looked at them in the way a kid looks at the toy section at the department store. Let's see how these robots are different from normal ones. 
how could they use ether energy as an alternate power source of electricity? We'll have our answer soon enough. Mark's face brightly glowed as he dismantled them to pick up some important components. Three and a half hours later, Mark's spirit was seen engrossed in making a large-sized multi-headed robot dog using the spare parts from the destroyed ones and the machines available around him. He had a couple of built-in robots from the factory as assistants for more precision and faster. Eventually, a seven-foot big large-sized robot dog with three heads was built successfully. It was quite an achievement considering it has only been a little more than 200 minutes have passed. Looking at it, Mark imagined the figure he took inspiration from and mumbled in a bit of disappointment. That Cerberus looked menacing but this looked quite docile even with its size and their eyes are also slightly small but then again, I didn't have the necessary equipment to make my own camera lens. I had to use what I have at the moment, even to give it a zooming function. I had to buy 20x scopes and modify them so that they cover their eyes with a voice activated function from me. Anyway, let's test it and see the final result. If this prototype works, then, I can make better ones in the future. I can even add various weapons to it. Taking it to the open area of the testing area within the factory realm, Mark then jumped onto his back and pressed his hand at the joint part where its three heads attached to its body. There was a type B socket to plug in the adapter, but, Mark intends to test with the ether energy, he placed his hand over it and concentrated a lot trying to pour as little ether energy as he could. After all, a rank 5 robot consumes about 1000 ether particles worth of energy to run for a whole day. He doesn't know its rank yet but he was confident that it won't exceed rank 5 as he didn't use stronger materials anyway and much of its body was also salvaged from rank 3 robot dogs and rank 3 battle robots. Hence, he was wary about pouring the ether energy not wanting to short circuit it. Mark just wants to know whether it is working or not, and just as his ether energy entered the prototype and reached its batteries, they instantly passed the current all over its circuits. The six eyes of the prototype glowed up in blue as if it came to life. Woof woof woof, the three-headed robot dog let out powerful barks simultaneously, lighting up the eyes of Mark in excitement, but, his happiness was only short-lived. Before he even got down onto the ground and took a good look at his invention, he heard something like an explosion inside the dog and heavy smoke coming out of their mouths, and their heads were hung down. System, activate, analysis LV2, he analyzed the dog in a hurry. And the system only gave him a piece of bad news in response. Ding, the circuits were fried completely due to incorrect voltage input component failure, and a power surge. As if that wasn't enough, the sassy system went on adding a comment of its own. Ding. System score, 2.5. Don't put too much focus on the exterior appearance, host. Damn it. Mark's face darkened. Chapter 438, Unexpected Success and Dashed Expectations. Returning to the real world in disappointment, Mark took a nap to clear his head from having any sort of negative thoughts. After taking a nap for an hour, he freshened himself with a shower and then dressed up for the grand banquet arranged by King Shenu in his welcome. The courtiers, officials, top military personnel, and wealthy individuals all attended the banquet. Song Wen Xin Ling joined the other ladies. Mark felt the atmosphere is quite similar to the one he had at the Eastern Sun. There, he was a visiting guest. So, he was fine, but, here, he is going to be the son-in-law and he didn't like these things to stay that way. Upon remembering Xin Ling's ambition behind this marriage with him, Mark felt like he should play more of an active role rather than standing behind her as the princess was going to overthrow the patriarchal system in the kingdom. But then again, he doesn't want the matriarchy system as Xin Ling wanted either. After all, it won't improve the lives of women except for bringing additional chaos. Xin Ling knows that and she has her own plans to deal with the consequences too, but... Mark also has his own plans for her, and he should make sure that she stays in the dark as long as possible. 
the princess is smart enough to figure out his whole secret just by connecting the info she has with his past actions. As her cooperation is too integral to his kingdom building strategy and he doesn't want to use threats now that he chose the path of marriage, Mark felt like he should be very careful whenever reveals his plans to her. Back to the present, after the banquet was finished, Mark made a visit to the branch store to see how Chang Bo and Meng Tao were doing. As neared the store, he saw a huge line in front of the entrance even though the sun in on everyone's heads. Mark was astounded to see such popularity of his store's branch, which was officially opened only two days ago. Unless the royal family publicized extensively, it shouldn't be possible. He couldn't help but think of his main branch which was out of business for more than a week now. Curious about this incident, he tapped the shoulder of the person standing at the last of the line. Excuse me. Yes. The guy turned around to look at Mark, he didn't recognize him and just asked, may I help you with something? Mark pointed at the tower and asked, why there are so many people? Oh, you must not have heard about it. The young man's face just glowed in excitement as he explained, the food served over there is top notch. Even normal egg fried rice tastes like a delicacy, the best dish, Meng's roasted spirit duck was just heavenly. You know the best part? It only costs three gold coins. You, That is a weapon store, right? Mark couldn't believe his ears properly. Why this guy is talking about food? The stranger then nodded. It is but, it's just the bottom and the first floor. On the second floor, there is a clothing store. On the third floor, there is an alchemy store. On the fourth floor, there's a Gianzi challenge where there's a reward for the number of feather ball kicks. And there's also a quiz challenge to win the rewards. The fifth floor was occupied by the restaurant and the sixth floor was restricted. It's probably where the manager lives. Who knows? After a brief pause, the stranger finished with a comment, I should say these guys know how to do business. But then again, it is the king's son-in-law. You can't expect normal things from such a legendary figure. If Mark would hear this comment at another time, he would feel happy to hear such praise from a stranger as a third party, but his mood isn't good at the moment, he felt like his trust has been betrayed by Chang Bo and Meng Tao, he left the line and went to the back side of the tower, where there is another entrance, however, that can only be opened from the inside, he took out the communication scroll and contacted Chang Bo. The latter was busy explaining the features of an AK-47 and AK-203 to a customer, and he dropped the conversation and rushed to the back exit. Located in a small storage room behind the counter, as soon as he received the message, the large stone door, which is a part of the tower, was slid to the side within no time. Changbo greeted Mark in great excitement. Lord Lu, when did you arrive here? I thought you were supposed to come to Lunaris City. Five days later, please come inside. Mark stared at him with a look of frown on his face. He didn't respond for a while. The Welpire was startled for a moment when he saw his displeased boss. He asked, Lord Lu, is something matter? Mark raised his head to look at the tower and replied, I believe I told you to run a branch of Genesis Weapon Store, not turn it into a recreational hub. Recreational hub? Chang Bo never heard of such a word. Hence, he was confused a little bit but at least he got the gist of what Mark was trying to say. He politely said, we'll explain to you everything but please come inside. But, Mark was stern and gave an order as he stepped inside. I'll give you 60 seconds. Throw everyone out and drag Meng Tao's ass here. Even the ones who are eating? Chang Bo became slightly worried by Mark's order. Since he was promoted as a manager. He began to think like one. Mark gave him a cold gaze and answered, Everyone, including any other staff member you have hired so far, give whatever excuse you can give. Yes. Chang Bo flinched at Mark's gaze and he quickly scurried away. Mark didn't know what the well buyer has told everyone, but within just 90 seconds of time, the entrance door was closed and only three people remained in the store. Meng Tao and Chang Bo were standing beside each other in silence as Mark stared at them with clear displeasure written on his face, Chang Bo, explain yourself. Mark opened his mouth as he sat down on the chair, the teenager and the young adult gulped their saliva, chapter 439, 
a menu of transformation. Sometime later, Meng Ta and Changbo were kneeling on the floor with Mark sitting on the chair and staring at them. His anger couldn't be subsided no matter how much he tried to be calmer. Chang Bo and Meng Tao defend themselves earlier by how it incredibly made the store popular and how they raked in earnings of about 754 gold coins in just a matter of two days. If one considers the rewards they gave out in the form of guns and grenades and the cost of ingredients, the profits were still over 600 gold coins. Mark scolded them for misusing their freedom to do whatever they want and he shouldn't have put a teenager or a young adult to manage his store. He explained that he didn't lack money and that what he intends to do is to promote firearms. Chang Bo once again defended his actions by arguing that his strategy has made them sell 285 gold coins worth of firearms and ammunition. However, Mark wasn't convinced at all. He made the counter-argument that they didn't think of the store's reputation he built up so far, because of their actions, now people would have a wrong impression of the store. As Mark commented that he shouldn't have put immature boys like them as they have too many stupid ideas in their heads, Chang Bo felt wrong and he wanted to argue, but Meng Tao stopped him and forced him to kneel alongside him to apologize to their boss. After much thinking, Mark then called out the young adult, Meng Tao. Yes, Mark gave an order, go and bring me all the dishes that you sell here. Don't make too much. I only wanted to taste them. Meng Tao's face glowed up as he felt like their boss is giving him an opportunity to prove themselves. I'll return in a jiffy, boss. As Meng Tao rushed away to the stairs, Chang Bo looked hopeful at Mark. Mark didn't spare a glance at Chang Bo and stayed silent. The well buyer continued to kneel. After a few minutes, Meng Tao returned and informed him that the food was ready. Mark realized that this former heir of the Meng clan probably made it in huge amounts in advance and stored it in a storage ring. While storage rings will keep them fresh, the heat will be dissipated when the food entered that dimensional space. They have to be reheated after taking them out. This is probably what Meng Tao did. Or so. Mark thought as he went to the restaurant on the fifth floor. Before he left, he didn't forget to inform Chang Bo to continue to kneel until he returns. Chang Bo obliged his order. Meng Tao could only pat his shoulder in sympathy and tried to cheer him up by saying that his food will improve their boss mood. As Meng Tao followed his boss, Chang Bo looked down at the floor. He almost felt like crying as he was mumbling, I shouldn't have left his side when he gave me the offer. Life was so simple in Imperial City. Here, the ambition to earn more money has gone to my head and I became too greedy. Meanwhile, Mark sat at the table and Meng Tao served the dishes on small plates. The moment Mark's eyes fell on the first dish, the stir-fried vegetables, his gaze changed a bit, I see. So, these aren't made by him. Okay, let's see how good it will be. He picked up the chopsticks. MMM. It was just stir fried vegetables but Mark remembered the times he enjoyed the food made by Arlena. Seeing Mark's expression, Meng Tao's nervousness disappeared and he served the next set of dishes more confidently. Boss. This is steamed fish. The primary ingredient is the dragonfish. One circle realm. Boss. The eggs used in this fried rice belonged to Spirit Ostrich Queen, Three Circle, Boss. This is sweet and sour ribs, a delicacy from my hometown. The pork meat we used is of the Spirit Thunder Pig, Four Circle, Dot, Dot, Dot. And this is the highlight of our restaurant. It is roasted Spirit Duck but my version. Well, I should say it is my mum's recipe. Please try it. Mark tasted 12 dishes and there was no dish that he could say was average. He liked everything and all of that earlier anger was gone. If he doesn't put such talent to use, he would be an idiot. But, he didn't praise Meng Tao. Instead, he said, bring out Kylan. I want to talk to it. Eh? Meng Tao was slightly taken aback but he did it as he was asked. Soon, his eyes turned scarlet and his voice changed. Lu Zen. Mark looked at the youngster and smiled. I know that it was you who did all these dishes and not your host. But, anyways, good job. Thanks but I only did the cooking, following Meng Tao's directions. Hence, he is the one worthy of your praise. 
replied the Kailin spirit that was possessing Meng Tao. Mark shrugged his shoulders. He is a soldier, not a cook. I don't want to encourage him. After a while, Mark returned downstairs and Chang Bo prepared himself to apologize to him, promising him that he won't do such things again. However, to his surprise, before he even gets to open his mouth, Mark ended his punishment and further gave him permission to continue with his theme. Chang Bo couldn't help but gratefully look at Meng Tao. And then Mark went on to modify their theme, a bit slightly. Since the space has been constricted, we will be selling only selective models. On the first floor, it will be non the firearms like AK-47 and AK-203, rocket launchers, explosives like C-4, and grenades, the low-level ones like the pistol, revolvers, and semi-automatic handguns will be taken out and placed in the reward section on the fourth floor. And the second floor's display shelves will be filled with ether firearms. I'll send you the required ones. I also want you to visit the furniture store and custom order some designs like the battle tanks, robots, and others I give you later on. As for the restaurant, raise the food prices and the quality of the ingredients. The food will be free for those who purchase firearms, although not unlimited. For example, if one buys a grenade worth 100 gold coins, they can eat dishes worth a maximum of 100 gold coins. However, takeaway is not available in that condition. And there are too few games above, we have enough space to include two more events. You are using the sixth floor to live together and also the kitchen. Vacate it. I'll provide your accommodation elsewhere. We will also rent a kitchen outside, instead, we use the sixth floor as a bar, I mean, a pub, we fill with drinks of variety, but, to access all of these additional floors, the customers would have to pay a subscription fee. It is like paying a fee per month to become an exclusive member. We'll do something about this during the next week. Until the changes get implemented, the store will remain closed, Meng Tao and Chang Bo looked at each other trying their best to digest the changes instructed by their boss. Understood, my lord. Chapter 440, Imperial Intrigues and Throne Trials. A week passed away in a blink of an eye. During this time, Mark was busy implementing his plans for the store and it was going rather well. He couldn't help but look forward to the day when it reopens. In the meantime, he won a new type of battle tank from the lottery wheel to sell. The battle tank was based on Merkava 4 from Mark's past world. With each unit costing just about 7,500 gold coins, the main battle tank is something that can destroy any spirit warrior below the high six circle realm and is durable enough to block the attacks below the six circle realm. Perhaps, the only disadvantage it has, like any other battle tank, is the speed. But then again, the smoothbore gun, 120 mm, of the battle tank could attack enemies from as far away as 3 to 4 kilometers. So, it shouldn't be an issue. Another disadvantage is that these are too heavy and it will be challenging to navigate in certain terrains, such as soft or uneven ground, forests, or urban areas. This can make them more vulnerable to ambushes and restrict their operational flexibility. There is also high fuel consumption due to their large engines but since Mark planned on using his oil attribute to sell even the gasoline and all other types of fuel, it is cool. Meanwhile, Peace returned to Western Yan, Feng Wu's nephew and the only remaining heir of the past king, Feng Chun ascended to the throne at the tender age of eight. Obviously, that means Feng Wu will be ruling in Feng Chun's place until the latter grew up into an adult. The coronation ceremony went quite well with the attendance of the Crown Prince Shang Wei from the Phoenix Empire, King Shen Nu from Western Moon, King Uyang Zhen from Eastern Sun, respective envoys from the Dwarven Kingdom, Kailin Empire, and Kun Empire. The Leon Empire even sent one of the princes with a general to the ceremony. Everyone formally acknowledged the ruling of the Feng dynasty once again at Western Yan. There, Shen Nu proposed the embassy system to fellow representatives. Only Uyang Zhen and Feng Chun gave their assent. The remaining could only take the proposal to their rulers. As agreed on beforehand, the hostages were released by the Western Yan. The Jie family, General Hu, and his soldiers, 
everyone except for the experts of the Church of Nuwa were released. Shang Wei also demanded Uyang's enter his release sister from captivity, however, Lan Jing replied that he cannot control the Zheng. He merely was contracted to it. According to the newspapers, the Zheng was contracted to Uyang Zhen's prime minister, Lan Jing, and he abducted the daughter of the emperor to force him into making peace with Feng Wu. It is what Mark wanted to happen so that his name don't be attached to Western Yan as a key ally, and Lan Jing also cooperated with him, just like several other things as he wanted to go back home with the heir of the ancient land sect. Shang Wei could only return empty-handed, disappointing his parents. Lan Jini I swore in her heart that she brings back her child. And within two days of the coronation ceremony, there was a huge battle in the Kuniu mountain range. Forests were destroyed, hills were razed to the ground, and several indigenous tribes living in the mountains without any contact with the outside world were wiped out. But Lan Jini I couldn't achieve victory against the five-tailed scarlet leopard. She lost her challenge and can no longer demand her daughter from the Zheng. Hence, she can only try an emotional angle. She would visit him daily and request for her daughter's release. As time passed, Zheng's attachment to her and her late father affected him and made him softer. Meanwhile, at the Imperial City, the trial for the Imperial Throne has started. About five contestants ended up in the race but unfortunately, Shang Wei didn't appear to be the favorite as the clan lords had expected. From the imperial family, there are only two Shang Wei, third prince, and Shang Zexi, crown prince. The second prince isn't interested in the throne and he would have to leave very soon while the fourth prince prefers to stay in the shadows. As for the remaining three, one is the emperor's younger brother from a different mother. Shang Xing, aged 51, is the son of the queen consort of Shang Fu's predecessor. He and Shang Fu fought for the throne but the latter won with more support as he was not only the crown prince but also awakened the bloodline of the phoenix. Since then, the grand prince stayed out of politics. Now that an opportunity came before him, Shang Xing jumped into the race. The fourth contender, named Shang Hao, is a distant relative of the imperial family but still bears the surname as he was a direct descendant of Shang Fu's predecessor's predecessor's brother. Shang Hao is currently working as the vice secretary of the Department of State Affairs. He isn't exactly what you call a key figure but still holds connections with the major noble clans. And the final contender is surprisingly Shang Xiang's eldest son, Shang Jun, aged only 27 years old. This young man was once touted as a genius who has the highest chance to become a supreme realm expert. Born from Shang Xiang's concubine who hailed from Dragon Empire, Shang Jun was not only blessed with the Phoenix bloodline but he also became a spirit warrior at the age of five. When he was eight, he was already in the Two Circle Realm. However, in a suspicious incident in the past, when he and his mother were ambushed in the Wild Zone, his mother was killed along with the guards while one of them grabbed and escaped. A timely save from a wandering spirit warrior saved his life but by that time, the kid has lost his cultivation. Since then, he was looked down on by family members and relatives. He faced a lot of bullying in the young but his father turned a blind eye. After seven years, the 15-year-old coincidentally met the same wandering spirit warriors, who took him as a disciple. And together, they embarked on a journey. No one knows where they have been or what Shang Jun was doing, but as he returned home a week ago after being away for 14 years, he somehow gained the cultivation and entered the Seven Circle Realm while still having the abilities given by the Phoenix Bloodline. Chapter 441, Triumph in the Dungeon, Shang Jun's Victorious Battle, Back to the Competition for the Throne. It's been four days since it began and the first round in this trial was about to end. The first round was named the Trial of Monsters. For this round, Dungeon of Van Claw was selected. The six-star dungeon in the Jin province was explored by Bei Aixun and the Imperial Army made sure that no 30-party adventurer stay in the place. The mission was simple. The five contenders have to enter the dungeon and make a contract with a beast of at least four circle realm within a time limit and return. 
those who are unsuccessful will be eliminated from the competition right away. If there are multiple contenders who are successful, the one with the highest scores, depending on the type of contracted beast, will be receiving an advantage during the next trial. The contenders will enter the place alone without any help. Shang Jun has the advantage due to his high cultivation while Shang Hao has the lowest chance. Shang Xiang has contracted with the peak 5 circle realm beast of fierce grade named Sylphia, a fire-breathing wolf. Shang Zexi was also successful in contracting with a low 6 circle realm beast but of normal grade named the Armored Elephant. Shang Wei surprised everyone by going for a four-circle realm beast. Some experts lauded him for his cleverness as he had come out by sitting on a horse. It was a lightning element horse. Despite its low level, it can still run up at the speed of 250 km per hour. However, there are some that criticized him too as he can fly with phoenix wings when he enters the six-circle realm. But, his supporters defended him by saying that an emperor looks cooler riding a horse compared to flying with fiery wings. Meanwhile, Shang Ho and Shang Jun were still inside. After several failures, the 33-year-old was currently trying to tame a four-horn large bison, peak four circle of fierce grade. He was hanging onto its back as it was aggressively jumping around like a bull, trying to shake him off its back. Its energy level slowly dipped down as time passed and Shang Ho's confidence grew up. Unfortunately, for him, fate put Shang Jun in his path. Before he accomplished the task, the bison suddenly disappeared alongside every other creature in the region. Thud. Shang Ho fell on his butt and was taken aback by the situation. What the hell has happened? He wondered before his eyes fell on a giant crab-like creature with a dark, black shell. The beast was coming toward him and Shang Ho's face turned pale in fear. He quickly started running away in a random direction but the creature didn't chase after him. It went toward the portal, which could only be accessed by humans. It entered the portal and exited the dungeon, where a huge campsite was built around with people waiting for the contenders. Since it was the last day, Emperor Shang and the other princes have been paying attention to the dungeon in anticipation that Shang Jun gets disqualified. As any father, he wants his children to become more successful than the others. If someone has to become the next emperor, it should be his child, not his brother's son. Once Shang Jun becomes the emperor, the descendants of Shang Fu will become a branch family while the former's family will become the imperial family. He knew his eldest son very well. Shang Zexi would definitely rebel if Shang Jun sits on the throne. More than so, he was inwardly rooting for Shang Wei to succeed him. And Shang Jun's sudden entry also threatened that dream. However, as they saw the giant crab, everyone's expression became serious. He managed to tame the Beast King, mumbled Shang Fu with a darkened expression. The fact that Shang Jun even managed to beat down the ego of a beast king only showcases his ability. But, it isn't over yet. Upon reaching the emperor's campsite, Shang Fu jumped down to the ground and walked toward him. He questioned the supreme commander whether he passes the first trial. As Bei Xon nodded, he went on to ask whether the following trials have anything to do with the captured beast. As the details of the following rounds were already announced, Bei Xun wondered whether there is something wrong with his long-haired prince and replied, you can use contracted beasts in the battle. The six-foot handsome hunk then smiled before leaving a comment, then, I'll put it to a better use. Neither Bei Xun nor the people around him understood what he meant, but taking them by surprise once again, Shang Jun walked to the Beast King and closed his eyes, release. The phoenix flames burned the invisible chains between him and the Beast King, freeing it from the contract. The Crab King, Van Claw frowned inwardly as it asked him in a deep voice similar to that of a human, What are you doing? Why did you sever the bond? Shang Jun smiled as he summoned a semi-divine grade sword and poured his ether energy into it. Sorry but your usefulness has ended. Perhaps, a dead one is more useful. How dare you? The Crab King roared in anger, alerting the soldiers around and even the Supreme Commander. As the Crab King raised its sharp and raised pincers to attack its former contractor, the latter rushed forward with phoenix wings erupting from his back. 
However, the flames weren't scarlet like the second prince. The flame was blue. Meanwhile, the broad sword in his hand grew 100 times bigger with blue flames enveloping the blade. Jumping high, Shang Jun sliced at the crab's shell. The hard shell couldn't block his attack. It was perfectly cleaved into two. Shang Jun then proceeded to cut down its head where its core is located. He placed the large head in his storage ring and left behind everything. A few moments ago, it is a beast king, the overlord of the dungeon, but now, it is a huge corpse that couldn't even be cooked and eaten as it is risky to eat a dead crab. Okay, that was done. Maintaining a smile on his face, Shang Jun kept away the sword and clapped twice for his effort before bowing toward the core. Thank you for your contribution. Your sacrifice will be remembered. Everyone. Chapter 442 Trial of the Scrolls, Unveiling the Path to Wisdom With Shang Ho out of the race, only four remained. The next day morning, at the imperial court filled with officials, the four contenders stood beside each other as they stared at the emperor sitting on the throne. Shang Fu went on to say, the second phase is the trial of the wisdom. As you have been informed earlier, this trial focuses on your wisdom. He shifted his attention to the officials and continued, in the upcoming trial, the contenders are presented with a series of intricate puzzles, riddles, and tests of intellect. They must unravel ancient scrolls, decipher cryptic symbols, and solve complex logic puzzles. The trial focuses on their strategic thinking, problem-solving skills, and ability to make wise and sound decisions under pressure. He shifted his attention back to the contenders and spoke. The trial of wisdom has seven stages. Each day, one stage. The time limit will be sunset. For the first stage of this trial, the four of you will be locked in different chambers filled with ancient scrolls. The fragmented information about the emperor's lineage and historical events is scattered around the chamber. You just have to collect and piece together the scrolls, arranging them in the correct chronological order. You receive a score based on how much work you have completed. For this task, the maximum score also varies according to the difficulty. Your scores will add up as you go through a different stage of the trial on each day. By the end of the seventh day, the one with the least score will be eliminated. As for which room each one will go to, it depends on your choice. As the highest scored contender during the previous trial, Prince Shang Jun would get the first choice. Here are the five scrolls. The Emperor gave the scrolls to Bei Xun, who then passed them to Shang Jun. He opened one. It basically contained the difficulty level in the form of chess pieces, like a soldier, max, 50, is the weakest and easiest difficulty, followed by the Royal Knight, max, 100, Captain, max, 100, General, max, 150, and Supreme Commander, max, 300. This time, Shang Jun didn't go for the best one, assuming that it will be too difficult. He took the general level difficulty. After him, Shang Zexi's turn came. However, he too was reluctant to choose the hardest one. He chose captain level difficulty. Shang Xiang followed the same way and chose the royal knight difficulty, leaving the third prince with the option of two extremes. As Shang Wei was staring at each of them, the crown prince laughed inwardly. He was delighted to see his prime opponent will end up at a disadvantage whatever choice he makes. In the end, the third prince gave one scroll back to the supreme commander and spoke, I will take this. Bei Aixun opened it curiously and saw that he had the soldier level difficulty one, meaning Shang Wei will be facing the most difficult one. He personally created this trial and knew how difficult it is going to be. Still, as a person who swore an oath to neutrality, he cannot take any sides, and he acted as if he doesn't care. Contenders, I believe you must have already seen the location written in your scrolls. So, you have to find your way to it. There is no prohibition for assistance. You can take the help to find your way to your respective destinations, said the emperor before adding, remember, all of you have time only until the sunset. Good luck. Lunaris City, Western Moon Kingdom, in the empty plot of land behind the barracks, soldiers were seen crouching on one of their knees while having ether pistols in their hands, 
targets were placed about 20 meters away in the form of scarecrows amidst them. There were also a couple of battle robots with rank 1 and rank 3 respectively. Meanwhile, Mark was shouting like an officer, Now, look at them, don't you feel humiliated when these things could strike the target more precisely than you do? All of you can single-handedly beat them in close combat but you lose when in ranged battle. Why? Is it because you weren't accustomed to the firearms? No, that is an excuse for the civilian level soldiers, not royal knights like you guys. If you couldn't handle small firearms like these, how could you handle big ones? You must have heard about the Phoenix Empire's recent war with our southern neighbor. Before the supreme beings were involved, the Kuni'u royal force guarded their land by not letting any foreigners into their land and even kept peace in the Gong city. How? They were weak but they had the firearms. They mastered assault rifles and sniper rifles, which can strike targets far away that an arrow can reach. I'm not telling you to depend on firearms. Just treat them as a tool to have an advantage over your enemies. And how could you master the art of gun firing when you people are not trying hard enough? Put more concentration on the targets. Don't let your gaze move here and there. Don't let your hand shiver. You'll do fine. Now, again, shoot go for the head. As Mark was done with his store and learned about everything that there is about the kingdom, through Xin Ling, during the past week, he left the store in Chang Bo's hands and went to train the firearms unit comprised of 500 soldiers, in which 10 royal knights are included, he planned to make one of those royal knights a general for this division. In the meantime, he also started a work called Project C. C stands for Cerberus. He planned to create a mechanical Cerberus capable of moving on its own like a battle robot while equipped with several types of guns. For now, he was using the spare parts of the destroyed robots, especially their batteries. So far, he made four such prototypes but none of them worked. So far, after a few trials and errors, he realized that the internal batteries appeared to be an issue. The multiple batteries from different robots are the ones that make the problem. Hence, Mark decided to take them out, and for the past three days, he was busy making an external battery as a power source. However, making it from scratch is something of an arduous task. Hence, he dismantled the remaining batteries and merged them all to create a bigger one. Only one more shot is remaining and he doesn't want to get any failure. The circuits and every other part went through multiple checks. And tonight will be the day he will assemble the prototype and go through testing. Mark was excited about it and that excitement showed in today's training. He was slightly more aggressive as he trained the Royal Knights in handling the guns. The evening arrived. Back at Imperial City's Imperial Palace, everyone was waiting for the contenders to come out of the chambers. Meanwhile, in Lunary City's Royal Palace, Mark was looking forward to bedtime. He was having tea with the king and talking about the power dynamics. All of a sudden, a holographic screen suddenly pops up in front of his eyes with a message from the system. Ding. You received a message from Alan Spencer. Message, big bro, Queen Consort Lan Jinny is here and she intends to talk to you. It appeared she figured out the truth about Shang Zhao's abduction. Mark's facial expression changed when he saw that. He rose to his feet. What happened? Asked the King of Western Moon. Mark replied, I need to leave to handle an urgent situation. Please excuse me. Chapter 443, A Fractured Family, Lies, Hatred, and Despair. Using his teleportation skill, he traveled to Imperial City in an instant but it took time to return to the store. Fortunately, the surveillance in the outer sector has reduced by a lot or one should say it returned to usual, ever since Mark left the city for good. So, Mark had it easy as he arrived at his destination, where Lan Jin Yai was waiting upstairs living room. Upon seeing him, she commented, you really could teleport, huh, one of my many talents I suppose. Mark shrugged his shoulders and calmly sat down, looking at her. He then asked, so. What is it that Queen Consort Lan had to ask me that she visited me during the dusk and even threatened my sibling using false accusations? He planned to deny it until he cannot do so. Lan Jinni took a deep breath and replied in a serious tone, 
Lan Yu has told me that you were the one who abducted Shang Zhao and you were also the mastermind behind this war, the Gold Dragon, the Demon King from Hell, and the Zheng, all of them just followed your orders and played in the grand scheme of yours, Mark didn't expect the Zheng would reveal his plan, he decided to confront him but for the moment, he needed to handle this woman, since the ultimate defense of the store has been upgraded and even demigods are useless, Mark was confident that this biological mother of his was completely at his mercy. Adding to the fact that she probably came to see him in secret, Mark planned to keep her as a prisoner in case the situation gets out of his hand. Looking straight into her eyes without any fear, he leaned back and said, if you think I did all those, then, you can inform your husband, the emperor. Since I'm no longer a citizen of your empire, I won't attend the summoning of the imperial court but he can use his connections with western moon's king to confront me. Why come here? You know why, replied Lan Jinyai. What do I know? Mark responded with the question. Lan Jinyai looked at the floor and took a deep breath before answering. The fact that you are not the child of Lu Yamu and Yi Zexi. Emperor Shang is your true father and I'm your, you are my biological mother, finished Mark in place of her, he actually didn't expect her to come out with the truth, but, her timing didn't make it any better, why did it have to be when Shang Jiao was abducted? Lan Jin Yai nodded as she continued to look down at her feet, not intending to lock her eyes on her son. Yeah? Mark stared at her for a while. After ten seconds of silence, he asked slowly, since, when have you known the truth that I know it? It's been a while, replied her mother. After a brief pause, she added, your sister told me about it after she accidentally heard you talking with Lan Jing. Mark then asked, tell me honestly, if your daughter hasn't been abducted, this day would never come right. Lan Jin Yai raised her head in shock, not expecting him to take it this way. She tried to defend herself, no, it's not what you think. I wanted to tell you a lot of times but you have hatred for us in your heart. Trust me, I thought of revealing it to you after we become a little closer but the opportunity never came due to various events. Mark's words hung heavily in the air as he let out a deep sigh, his voice filled with a somber tone, well. It may seem that time has slipped away, Queen Consort Lan, he uttered with a hint of resignation. Your husband is a notorious skirt chaser who precedes him, and I haven't been honest in the Imperial Court either. As many as 46 illegitimate children were killed and that sin was on his head. As for you, you are also a selfish individual who was willing to forsake the sect that nurtured you and even your own child for the pursuit of personal happiness. Regrettably, it appears that no matter what path you choose to redeem yourselves, forgiveness may remain elusive. The weight of his words reflected the depth of disappointment and skepticism in his heart. I don't believe I deserve forgiveness either, my son, Lan Jin Yai replied with a heavy heart. We cannot change the past, but we must find a way to create a better future. There must be something we can do to make amends and rebuild what has been broken. Her voice carried a mix of regret and determination as she looked into her son's eyes, hoping to convey her sincerity and willingness to make things right. However, the darkness in Mark's heart made him blind to see her sincerity, he said, in the future that I want to build, there is no place for you or your husband in my story, Queen Consort Lan. Nevertheless, you still gave birth to this body, hence, I would thank you. As for my so-called sister, don't worry, she is safe and sound. Unlike you, I don't do injustice to my family, I may have used her to keep you away from the war, but in return, I'm compensating for it by training her. Rather than imprisonment, you can consider it like she was cultivating in seclusion. She will be returned very soon, but not before I see your husband's doom. Can you at least let me meet her once? Asked Lan Jin Yai dropping her plans of freeing her. I promise you that I will just talk to her once and leave. You can trust me on that. Mark, however, didn't intend to listen to her request too. He denied it right away. Sorry but I don't trust you. You are someone who was even willing to see your husband bow his head in humiliation rather than lending your strength. In fact, with your strength, you wouldn't need to send me away in secret. You wouldn't have worried about giving birth to a baby without the potential to become a spirit warrior, 
you could just stop your husband as he played around with the lives of the women, with you helping your husband, he wouldn't have depended on the major noble clans and perhaps be more righteous in his rule, the princes and the nobles would probably be more afraid of committing crimes against commoners, just a word from you would have been enough to make Li Zheng Kang and your dear mother-in-law stop their nefarious schemes of killing the innocents in the name of protecting your family's dignity. A demigod in the imperial family of Phoenix will bring the foreigners to come here and settle. The Phoenix Empire would have been more prosperous. The Phoenix Empire would have gotten more allies. Perhaps, I would have grown up as a prince and probably look up to you, trying to work hard as I follow the path of righteousness. But, you chose to hide your strength and behaved as if you are a civilian. Why? It's because you are afraid that your husband won't love you when he realizes that you are a demigod that can destroy his whole empire on a whim. He would fear you, to protect your secret. You continued to act for decades as a helpless queen who cannot do anything about the issues in the empire. Now, tell me, do you think you are trusted, worthy? Chapter 444 the Lamp of Wishes, Alan's surprising request. Langinii has no answer for Mark's accusation and she didn't appear to be interested to defend herself too. In the end, after a long silence, she rose to his feet and said, I understand that you won't trust me no matter what kind of reason I give you, but, I will have to say these words whether you believe them or not, Shang Zhen. It is true that I acted as a civilian and I ignored his actions as I was afraid of ruining my marriage, however, I didn't abandon you, rather, it is the opposite, if I didn't keep you away from me to change your fate, you would have passed away on your 25th birthday. I truly regretted it when I heard you were dead along with your parents. I can't do anything about it but what I can do now is to tell you the complete truth when you are ready to hear it. Before I leave, I assure you that your secret will be safe with me, but, I will not give up on searching for my daughter too. She turned around and started walking away. Great statement. But, why do you think? Mark wanted to say that he wouldn't allow her to leave as she pleased but taking him by surprise, Langinii turned into a blur and disappeared from his sight. What there? Mark stood up on his feet at once, shocked by what he witnessed so far. System, shouldn't my store disable the powers of even demigods? How did she teleport away? Mark fired at his system. Ding. The host confirmed that he no longer considers the imperial city as home. Hence, the store is no longer considered as the main branch, the skills exclusive to the store were disabled, why didn't you say it before? Mark raised his voice, feeling like he had almost shot in his own foot just now, what would have happened if he had attacked Langinii and then realizes that her powers aren't sealed, of course, she might have forgiven him based on the fact that she is his mother and still has feelings of guilt, however, it will also affect his justification as he brings down the Shang dynasty, the frustration made him shout at the system, which coolly responded with a notification, ding, the system remembers informing the host about such a rule long ago, it isn't the fault of the system if the host forgets it, Mark's face reddened further as frustration turned into embarrassment, fine, it's my fault, since you disabled the skills, then, you could transfer it to the branch at Lunaris City. Ding. Do you wish to switch your main branch from Imperial City to Lunaris City? Ding. Note. The current store at Imperial City will turn into a branch and will replace the branch store at Lunaris City in the side quest. Note 2. The blueprint will be transferred to the new main branch. There's a side quest that asked him to open branches in different cities and make a sale of 1000 weapons per each. Shifting the main branch would be a good idea as the store at the Imperial City has already attained fame enough to pull in the crowds. However, the following note stated that the residence will also be shifted. It'll turn the six-story tower into a residential mansion. More than an upgrade, it could be a downgrade. Hence. Mark threw away such an idea and planned to create a main store somewhere else. Furthermore, he had another question in his mind he would have to solve. Before Langinii left, she said that if she didn't abandon him, he would die on his 25th birthday. Luzen's parents always celebrated his birthday on the fourth day of the tenth month of the year. After their deaths, 
he found that it was false from a family friend with whom he had worked for ten years. Lu Zhen didn't care much about it as he felt his birthday no longer mattered. Meanwhile, the third prince celebrates on fourth day of the seventh month of the year. Mark knew that his soul was merged with Lu Zhen's soul on the same day as his real birthday. Hence, technically, Lu Zhen died on the day he turned twenty-five. Then, did Lan Jinyai foresee his death? How? Even after what she indirectly termed as a sacrifice for the greater good, it still happened. An irremovable curse? Or some kind of hereditary disease? Mark didn't know what it is but he knew that the time will come again. He has to be patient for now. Mark went into meditation for a while in order to clear his head of any messy thoughts. As the sun set in the west, the darkness loomed over the empire. At the imperial palace, the emperor announced the scores of the contenders. Shang Wei took the lead with almost perfect marks, 285, followed by Shang Jun, 150, then, Shang Xiang, 100, and finally, Shang Zexi, 90. After their results were out, everyone was dismissed and told to wait for the next day. Meanwhile, Mark was served dinner by Alan. As he was eating, the android kept on staring at him until the former questioned him. What is it, Alan? You look like you want to say something. Mark urged him to speak without any hesitation. Alan took a couple of seconds and then asked, I was just wondering what it feels like to love someone. Love? Mark looked at him in wonder. Why the sudden curiosity? He asked. Lings. Alan was about to tell about his talk with Lings but for some reason, he couldn't say it. He covered it up by saying, nothing. Earlier Sistigs was talking about you and Lady Song loving each other and caring for each other. I'm just curious and wanted to confirm something. Big bro, tell me please. Alan didn't realize himself, but just now, he lied to the only one who he stays loyal. As he urged Mark, the latter answered with a smile while remembering Song. It is actually tough to explain, but, if I had to simplify. When you love someone, you would have a strong emotional bond with the person. Just thinking about your love will bring a smile to your face. You would miss her greatly when you are alone. When you are happy, you would want to share it with her first. When you are sad, she is the last person you would want to share it with. Even if you are the strongest person in the world, you would still feel vulnerable in her presence, and you enjoy such a feeling. Everyone has their own way of expressing their love, but, if you ask me, Song was the light that filled the darkness in my heart. In her presence, I would forget about revenge and just feel like enjoying the present. If I had to make a choice between her and the rest of the world, at any given time, I wouldn't hesitate to burn the whole world. Does love has such power? Alan asked innocently. Mark smiled as he answered. It's because you love someone with your heart. And the heart always has the power to suppress the logical reasoning of the brain. Heart, huh? Alan mumbled in a low tone as he placed his hand on his own chest. Mark continued with his dinner. He cut a large piece of steak and stuffed his mouth, enjoying the taste. As he was busy chewing it, Alan suddenly spoke. Big bro, I want to become a human. Can you use the lamp of wishes to turn me into a human? Cough cough. Mark swallowed at once due to the shock. For a couple of seconds, he suffocated with the food stuck in his throat. Alan hurriedly gave him the glass of water. He hurriedly drank it and swallowed down the hole, placing it on the table. He looked at the android. What did you say? Chapter 445, Forbidden Love, The Decision to Become Human. A couple of minutes later, a eerie silence filled in the room. Mark didn't know what to speak either. An android and a human loving each other, perhaps, only in movies, he saw such weird things. And then, Lings knows the truth and breaks off their relationship. For a moment, he felt like a side character and Alan was the main character of the story. It was quite cinematic. But then again, this is reality. Such a taboo relationship isn't acceptable here. And that is why Alan wanted to become a human. It wasn't as if he doesn't understand Alan's sincerity. He even confirmed with the system that it can create a physical body for Alan and transfer his core into the body. The new body will not have any soul and will die when the core is destroyed. 
However, doing this would not only disconnect Alan and Mark but the latter even had to sacrifice the lamp of wishes as the cool down timer will be 10 years before using it again. As a part of his explanation, he even promised to make a new body for Alina as long as they can gather the required materials, but, it is a tough decision for Mark. On one hand, he wants to help out Alan's love, and on another hand, he doesn't want to take unnecessary risks. As Mark was thinking about what decision he should take, Alan then further said, Big bro, in my current situation, I'm not strong enough to guard you and neither could I help you in innovations as it would waste my skills. After turning into a human, I plan to turn into a weapon research specialist. The knowledge I receive from the system so far will be enough for me to help you in setting up a research facility. In the meantime, we can study the physical body I left behind for our project android to create a perfect body for Alina. Until then, Alina can stay in the Cerberus, robotic version of Cerberus. Let me assist you in Project C. Mark thought for a bit, if it was someone else, perhaps, Mark would have thought about the pros and cons. However, Alan is someone special to him, as he earlier mentioned, the heart has the power to control the logic of the brain when such special people are involved. Mark wanted to see Alan happier, taking a deep breath. Mark spoke softly, his voice filled with a mix of concern and determination. Alan, I understand you, but, before taking the decision, I need to talk with Lingz. I want to see if she truly loves you as you described or if it is just your delusion. Alan replied, it might be a bit tough as she was emotionally unstable at the moment. However, I can share with you the recorded data of our last meeting. Okay, do it. Mark went on to watch the recording. Alan was quite uncomfortable while sharing the memory of that night, but if he wants the approval of his big bro, there was no way out of it. Upon watching the whole clip, Mark could only let out a deep sigh and nodded slowly, I see that she acted quite emotional for someone known to be cold and elusive. And she also seems to be deeply broken by your truth. Alright, I support your love. I will turn you into a human, Alan. Alan's face glowed brightly in happiness and he cowed out right away, expressing his thankfulness, I'm grateful to have an owner like you, big bro. It is out of my calculations to see such a day. Mark sighed again as he commented, AI. I didn't expect to see such a day either. Sometime later, system, open the blueprint section. A series of blueprints appeared on the holographic screen. He needs to spend 800,000 credits to complete the side quest and acquire the Lamp of Wishes and the Staff of Blessing at the same time. Hence, he decided to upgrade his store instead of spending it all on purchasing skills or items. The current one stands at 25,000 gold coins, somewhere in the middle. However, he had to spend a lot. So, he didn't look at anything else on the way and just scrolled and scrolled to the right until he entered the high end section. The blueprint goes all the way to a billion gold coins. Hence, he didn't go too far and just looked around the 4 to 10 million range. In the end, he chose the one with a price of about 6.5 million gold coins, i.e. 1.3 million credits. Ding. Upgrade the interior of the store, right now? How long it will take for the upgrade? Mark asked. The last time he upgraded the store, it took 3 hours. Ding. The renovation will take 715 hours, i.e. 29 days and 19 hours. That long? Don't you think you are taking too much time? Mark was slightly taken aback by the completion time. If such a building will take more than a month time, what if he chose the most expensive interior? Will it take years? However, the system is always known to counter its host. Without any surprise, the system replied to him, Ding, in your past life terms and calculating the price of gold during the time of the host's death, right now, the host put an order to build a $5 billion palace with state-of-the-art facilities and still expecting it to be done in 24 hours or something? Mark could feel like the system appears to be angry or annoyed. He ended the argument right away. Fair enough, but, 
We won't proceed with the replacement right now. Put it on hold and drag the blueprint right to the front. I don't want to waste too much time with scrolling again. Ding. Affirmed. Mark closed the window without proceeding with the purchase as he intended to sleep there for the night. Alan was connected with Mark and he knew how his master will proceed with the purchase as well as the upgrade in the morning. He couldn't help but become excited and he wanted to tell this good news to Lynx. Perhaps, Mark's latest briefing about love had an effect on him. Alan couldn't just stop smiling as he imagined the girl. As midnight arrived, he left the store and made his way to the Lynn Mansion. Chapter 446, Return of Alina Mark's Factory Mark's spirit entered his factory space and the assistant robots proceeded with assembling all the parts. This time, the robotic Cerberus was connected to a large external battery which was fully powered. The whole thing was brought to the testing space and Mark proceeded with the launch. Mark land on its back to activate it. Just as he was about to switch it on, Mark took back his hand in nervousness. No. Let's not risk this. Mark remembered Alan's advice and wondered if he could integrate Alina's core into this robot by himself. But, he doesn't want to risk getting it damaged either. Hence, he consulted the system. System, can the core get damaged if something unexpected happens in this project? The system was always quick to reply. Ding. Negative. The exterior of the core is made from adamantium alloy, which can resist the attack of even a demigod. <laughs> then, this is safe, I guess. Mark brought the robot back to his lab and dismantled its upper body. A couple of hours later, with the help of assistant robots in the factory, he managed to build a cube-shaped battery compartment, somewhere below its joint neck. The connection to the external battery isn't removed as he inserted the glowing cube, taken from his inventory, into the battery compartment. Mark felt like the cube needed a jump start. The rest of the body was reassembled and then brought back to the testing space once again, landing on its back. Mark took a deep breath and reached out to the switch, please, let it work. Please let it work. Filled with nervousness, Mark switched it on and then jumped onto the ground. A tremendous amount of electrical power was released by the 500R battery and entered the robot. The glowing cube glowed more brightly, powering up everything in a couple of seconds. As the life came to the six eyes of the robotic Cerberus, instead of barking like it was designed, the middle head spoke in a human speech, and surprisingly, that too, in a female pitch he was familiar with, Big Brother, I can move. It let out a scream of delight as it extended its head toward Mark. Not being able to stop smiling, the latter touched the head and spoke, Welcome back, Alina. He doesn't need to question the three-headed robot further to ascertain that she is his Alina. Sorry for taking so long. I missed you replied Alina without feeling any discomfort in the body of a robotic dog. Meanwhile, at Lin Yu Ying's mansion, Alan was sitting on the window as he was silently staring at the sleeping beauty. Usually, this can be considered creepy, but the android has yet to understand such logic of privacy. He was just savoring the moment as he found her more beautiful, for some reason. There was warmness in his core and he couldn't stop smiling but it is quite difficult to understand what this new type of feeling he was experiencing. Taking Mark's lessons as advice, the android felt like this is probably love. He doesn't want to disturb her sleep and neither does he want to leave. Hence, during the whole night, he just stared at her, until it was dawn. By the time he returned to the store, Mark was found to be asleep. But he wasn't alone in the store. There was a seven foot big three headed robot dog lying in the living room, just like a dog does as it sleeps. There are a few books spread around it, one of them is opened. Upon his entry, it quickly woke up and looked at the android, Alan. Alan scanned it for a second and exclaimed in surprise, Alina, did Big Bra manage to integrate your core with it? Wow, he is really a genius. HMPF. Of course, my mark is the trailblazer, crafting the weapons that will define the future, replied Alina filled with pride in her voice. Your mark? As Alan raised his eyebrow, Alina patted the floor with his right paw, a figure of speech, lover boy, accessed Mark's memories and saw that you want to become a human because of Lady Lynn. You want to marry her, 
Huh? I'm really proud of you, my elder brother. You get to bang the beauty. I almost once had sex with Mark but you interrupted in a timely manner. Back then, I didn't think much but now, it seemed like that kissing was a good experience. Alan blushed in embarrassment before scolding her. Hey, watch your language. Will you grow up, bro? When you become a human, you'll be an adult. Hence, you should also behave like one. According to these books, once you were lovers, you could hold hands and embrace each other every once in a while, and could only have sex after you married. Or you visit a brothel if you want non-commitment sex. It was said that people often go there to experience it so that they get to perform better with their spouses. There were quite an amount of techniques described in the fourth novel. Even the main protagonist, Leon went there with his troublesome buddies. After turning into a human, I think you should. I believe Big Bro told you to stop reading those erotic novels, interrupted Mark as he was too embarrassed to hear her anymore. Furthermore, she wasn't in android form. Such words coming from a robotic Cerberus appeared even weirder. Alina let out a sigh and her robotic heads collapsed on the floor as she replied, I was too bored. Well, it won't be long before we leave this place. So, you just have to wait for a bit. Alan reminded her about the renovation while thinking about his upcoming new transformation. Soon, Mark woke up from his sleep, freshened up, and sat for breakfast. Alan sat patiently as Mark was having the food. He, however, became restless as every second of waiting felt like an hour. Once Mark was done, Alan could no longer wait and reminded him about the upgrade. Alina couldn't help herself teasing him again as soon as she saw the opportunity. Our dear Alan couldn't wait to prove his manhood to his lover, eh? Alan got irritated quickly, would you stop being so dirty, Alina? Ever since you were reborn in this robotic Cerberus, your speech is becoming uncontrollable. Ho. Oh. Our dear bridegroom is getting angry. As Alina continued to tease her older brother, Mark stopped her. Okay, that's enough. Let's have a serious discussion, Alan, sit down. As the android took his seat, Mark looked straight into his eyes and said, Mark, before taking this decision, you should remember one thing. Once you become a human, there's no coming back, not because there isn't a way or something. It is because you are taking a decision on your own and I don't want you to have regrets. Whatever it might be, you will have to stick with your decision. Understood? Alan nodded firmly. Good. Then, let's get this done. Mark opened the blueprint section and proceeded with the upgrade. Ding. 1.3 million credits have been deducted. Ding. System expansion is about to start in 5 seconds. Ding. You completed the side quest 3 and received Staff of Blessing and Lamp of Wishes as a reward. Ding. You received a new side quest. Chapter 447, Secret Ally for the Crown Prince, Mark's Role in the Trial. As the black colored barrier enveloped the store, Mark and Alan get transported out of the store. As for Alina, since she wasn't an android, she could be placed in the inventory. Hence, Mark stored her in one of his inventory slots before getting kicked out. After coming out in the open, Mark didn't waste time in equipping the exoskeleton suit and flew away. Alan followed him from behind until they reach a remote location with nothing but wild trees and plants around. Open inventory. From the inventory, he then took out an object that resembled a genie's lamp. Do I need to rub it or something? He wondered. Ding. You got it correctly. Assuming that a familiar looking genie will come out of the magical lamp, Mark rubbed it on its side, come out genie and grant my wishes. However, only smoke came out. There is no genie inside the lamp. Instead, he just got a notification. Ding. You used the lamp of wishes. The host may now state the wish, according to the wish, if it could be granted. The cooldown timer will change. Warning, please be careful when asking for the wish. The wrong choice of words might bring calamity to the host. With his cheeks reddened in embarrassment, Mark didn't argue with the system and spoke out loud. I wish for a healthy functioning human body for Alan's core to transfer into. Now for the conditions. It should have the same appearance as his current self but include all parts of a healthy adult male. 
the system should transfer his core into his new human body and not take his android body that was left behind. All of his current abilities and rank should be retained by his new body. Ding. Is that all? Once the wish was locked in, it cannot be changed. Mark thought, since you are already giving me a wish, I might as well add powers. Nah, if I will become too greedy, the cooldown timer will become so high that it will be unusable anymore. Let's just add a simple thing. He then said, the new body shall possess the light attribute and remain the owner of Ares, the sword of light. Ding. Locked in the wish? Proceed. Ding. Please wait for a while. Calculating. Ten seconds later. Ding. The wish shall be granted and here's a cool down timer of 12 years, 6 months, and 15 days. Note. The host cannot change the wish and can only modify it. Proceed with the wish. System. Ding. Proceeding with the wish. Mark's forehead brightly glowed in the next second before shooting out a beam of golden energy toward Alan. As the android was hit with it. He collapsed on the ground and his core was extracted by the system before dragging it into Mark's body. Ding. The process has been started. Estimated time for completion. 176 days. Ding. Trade Alan's android body for 20 million credits. No thanks. Mark placed Alan's body in the inventory as he rejected the system's offer. However, strangely, the system didn't stop. Ding. Trade Alan's android body for rank 6 android? A rank 6 android? Mark felt slightly suspicious. Why would the system offer such a deal? Nevertheless, he wasn't interested in selling it. Nope. He rejected it again. Little did he expect that the system didn't back down. It stayed persistent in acquiring the body. Ding. Trade Alan's android body for rank 7 android? A rank 7 android? It was then Mark felt too suspicious. As he remembered how the system attempted quite a few times on acquiring Alan, he couldn't help but ask, what is Alan's specialty? Is there a secret in his body or something? Ding. Alan's body was augmented by the upgrade crystals. Nope, even before that, you were interested in retrieving Alan from me, Mark argued back. This time, he felt like the system is hiding something. Ding. Alan's body is made of superior materials and is more precious than the rest. What kind of materials? Mark asked. But this time, there was no response from the system. HMPF, I can find it out myself. Mark planned to research it anyways. Hence, he thought the system's silence shouldn't be a big deal. Opening up a portal, he returned to Lunary's city and traveled to the royal palace by his vehicle. Roughly around a couple of hours later, at the imperial palace, the four contenders were summoned to the imperial court just like the earlier day. Emperor Shang then announced the second stage of the trial. Once again, they were locked in private chambers filled with hundreds of scrolls according to their difficulty. However, this round is about solving the riddles. The contenders are presented with a series of riddles and brain teasers that test their problem-solving skills and lateral thinking, they must unravel the mysteries and provide correct answers within a time limit. As the highest scorer of the previous trial, Shang Jun gets to choose once again. Even for the remaining five stages of the trial's second phase, he will be the first to choose two. Once again, he chose the second most difficult one. Shang Xiang also chose a safe route. However, the crown prince went with the toughest one, not intending to give an opportunity for his brother to get ahead of him in the race. And he lost this gamble as he wasn't as smart and intelligent as Shang Wei. Once again, he ended up getting the lowest score. The following day, they weren't locked anymore. Instead, a philosophical debate was conducted in front of the ministers and officials. Contenders must engage in a lively debate on philosophical topics and ethical dilemmas. They must present logical arguments, demonstrate critical thinking, and defend their positions against opposing viewpoints. In this round, a heavy competition occurred between Shang Wei and Shang Jun but the third prince eventually won the most score. On day four, contenders were faced with a simulated diplomatic scenario where they must negotiate and resolve conflicts between different factions or kingdoms. Their ability to navigate complex political situations, foster alliances, and find peaceful resolutions will be evaluated. Here, 
Shang Jun excelled the most. Despite the fact that Emperor Shang is rooting for his children, he couldn't help but praise Shang Jun's diplomatic ways, although it was only in theory. On day 5, contenders are presented with a strategic warfare scenario and must devise comprehensive battle plans to overcome challenges and achieve victory. They must demonstrate tactical acumen, resource management, and adaptability in their strategies. Once again, Shang Jun excelled here. On day 6, contenders were presented with a series of ethical dilemmas and must make difficult decisions that impact the well-being of the empire and its people, their ability to weigh consequences, consider multiple perspectives, and make wise judgments will be scrutinized. Shang Wei won this stage. By the end of day 6, Shang Wei was slightly leading with a score of 1245, Shang Jun was in second with a score of 1198, Shang Xiang was in third place with a score of 640 and Shang Zexi was in last place with a score of 610. The officials, the ministers, and the public weren't interested in who will emerge as the first in this trial. They wanted to know who will be eliminated. Only one last stage in the second trial remained and Shang Zexi wanted to make sure that he gets qualified for the next trial. The final stage of this trial is a test for leadership. Contenders are given a group of individuals with varying skills and personalities and must lead them through a challenging task or obstacle. Their leadership qualities, including decision making, communication, and motivation will be assessed. The three contenders arrived at the court to receive their helpers, but, the fourth one never arrived even as the time crossed half past nine in the morning, bringing a frown to the emperor. The servants couldn't find him in his allotted room either. Someone, go and fetch Shang Xiang, this instant, said the displeased emperor. Shang Wen, the second prince responded to it, your majesty, I'll go and investigate the matter. The crown prince, who seemed very pleased by the incident, stated his opinion, Your Majesty, we cannot delay the trial, any longer, it's already been more than 30 minutes. Those who don't give value to the time of the imperial court don't deserve to be your successor, I suggest you disqualify him right away. Yes, Your Majesty I agree, Your Majesty the Crown Prince is right, Your Majesty. The three ministers who are in Shang Zexi's camp chimed along so that their prince will be saved. Meanwhile, Shang Jun and Shang Wei glanced suspiciously at the crown prince, wondering whether he has something to do with it.